Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committees of General Welfare, joint with civil and human rights. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, we ask everyone to please place electronic devices on silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to do this quietly because my son is napping. Hold on. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this hearing on the committee, City Council Committee on General Welfare and Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Today, the committees will be hearing a series of bills concerning the city's rental assistance program and source of income discrimination. I want to thank my colleague, Chair Matthew Eugene, for holding this hearing with me today. The committees, the committees will hear intros 146 and 2047, and a pre-considered bill sponsored by me, Councilmember Stephen Levin, as well as uh, introduction 1020 sponsored by Councilmember Alika Ambry Samuel, introduction 1339 sponsored by Councilmember Diane Ayala, intro 2018 sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal and a pre-considered bill sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers. Rental assistance vouchers are the primary tools that we have in New York City to ensure that people are able to move out of shelter and into housing. Vouchers can also assist New Yorkers at risk of losing their housing to avoid eviction and entry into shelter. However, we know that the success of this program the success of this program depends on the ability of clients to actually use them. And we know that the current voucher amounts are woefully inadequate to secure housing. There is currently no neighborhood in the city where the median rental price for a studio is at or below the current city FEPS rate for an individual. Intro 146 would raise the voucher levels to the fair market rent as set by the HUD standard so that individuals and families are able to quickly, quickly exit shelter and into housing and avoid and or avoid entering the shelter system altogether. It is not uncommon for voucher recipients to spend years trying to secure an apartment. 
the inadequacy of the voucher amounts is not the only barrier people face in trying to utilize them. While denying somebody an apartment based on the method of paying their rent, voucher recipients face an additional hurdle of source of income discrimination in applying for apartments. According to Vocal New York and Cape Root Justice's recently released paper, voucher holders were three times less likely to get a response to an inquiry from an agent about a prospective apartment than applicants paying from employment. Voucher holders were also less likely to be invited to viewings and more likely to be told that apartments were no longer available <clears throat> than applicants not paying with a subsidy. And in some instances, applicants were outright told that vouchers were not accepted. Intro 1339, sponsored by Councilmember Ayala, would provide written notice to those potentially eligible <clears throat> for city rental assistance programs and inform them of their rights and resources available related to the source of income discrimination. Domestic violence is among the most frequently cited reasons for entry into shelter. And placement into a specialized DV shelter is subject to eligibility and availability in the system. Intro 2018, sponsored by Councilmember Colin Rosenthal, would require domestic violence services to be available in all shelters. The reports of upticks in domestic violence cases during the COVID-19 pandemic are especially concerning, and city shelters should be prepared with services for all survivors in shelter moving forward. The pre-considered bill that I am sponsoring would allow online access to rental assistance program status so that clients can know where their case stands rather than navigating the bureaucracy of calling HRA. Intro 2047 would help end housing discrimination for justice involved individuals by making it illegal to deny someone an apartment on the basis of an arrest record or conviction. Formerly incarcerated people are among the most vulnerable people to become homeless and housing is often just one of many significant challenges that they face upon re-entry. The COVID crisis has underscored the importance of safe and secure housing with the Centers of Disease Control issuing guidance for a nationwide eviction moratorium. It has never been more apparent that housing is healthcare and housing is a human right. With the overwhelming majority of the shelter population being Black and Latinx people, ensuring that the voucher levels are at sufficient amounts in order for people to swiftly use them emphasizes that housing justice is racial justice. I believe that the legislation included in today's hearing will make great strides to promote equity in housing by removing some of the barriers, just some, not all, keeping people from securing or maintaining their apartments. I wanna thank the advocates and members of the public and those with lived experience who are joining us remotely today. Thank you to representatives from the administration for joining us and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. We are joined by council members Perkins, Grodenchik, Barron, Holden, Lander, Salamanca, and Powers. Um, <coughs> Ayala will not is not joining us at this time, but um, I hope to hear from her later. I'd also like to thank my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, uh, Deidre Cheatham, my director of constituent services, and I want to thank committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omery, policy analyst, and Frank Sar Sarno, finance analyst. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Matthew Eugene, uh, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Levine. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Matthew Eugene, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you uh, for joining our joint uh, virtual hearing today. I would like to thank my co-chair, Stephen Levine, for convening on this very important uh, hearing today. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge my colleagues and, and on the committee, Councilmember Pickens and also Linda Baron. I don't know if Jerome is here. He would probably join us uh, later on. 
prior to, prior to COVID-19 pandemic, housing insecurity was already a significant issue plaguing New York City. As of January 2019, 83,277 83, individuals were experiencing homelessness in New York City. This number includes those experiencing street homelessness, as well as the thousand currently living in shelters throughout the city. They are formidable numbers. With a global pandemic, we are currently at a critical juncture that could exasperate this already critical housing crisis. As moratoriums on eviction begin to expire, it is imperative that the city, city, state, and federal officials act quickly to address what is certain to come a homelessness crisis of epic proportions. For its part, the city council will hear several bills today that attempt to address various aspects of this uh, homelessness problem in the city. While none of them, none of these measures will solve the issue completely, if passed, the bills will strengthen protections for housing application and improve access to support and rental assistance programs. As a city, it is of utmost importance that we strengthen the city human rights law to the greatest expense possible when it comes to discrimination in housing. While the city's law currently contains some of the strongest and most comprehensive protections, including prohibiting discrimination in housing based on a generous list of protected classes, there's always more to be done. In today's hearing, we will hear from the Commission of Human Rights, CCHR, about the source of Income Discrimination Unit and their overall effort to combat housing discrimination. The SOI unit has been instrumental in combating discrimination against those who apply for housing using the rental assistance vouchers. Between 2018 and 2019, the unit has investigated and resolved over 350 cases of solid discrimination. However, we heard at this uh, committee's uh, 2018 budget hearing, solid discrimination remains rampant in this city. This committee wants to ensure that CCHR is doing all that it can particularly in the upcoming months to ensure that those who are legally entitled to housing are not un unnecessarily prevented from obtaining it. In addition, given budget cuts, this committee will want to hear from CCHR are its plan to adjust shortfalls and whether it will apply the funding program such as Odds Fair Housing Initiative, a program that at the New York State Division of Human Rights has been enrolled in for a few years now. In addition, we will also hear feedback on Entro 2047, sponsored by my co-chair, Levine. This bill would ban the consideration of criminal history and housing by landlord real estate brokers and their employees or agents. In 2015, New York City restricted the use of arrest and criminal history check for employment purposes. However, no such protections exist in the housing context. In today's hearing, we present the first step toward addressing this very important issue. I look forward to hearing feedback on this bill and the many other bills our committee, committees are hearing today. I would like to thank the committee staff and council staff in general who are working hard behind the scene to make this uh, hearing possible. I would like now to turn it over back to my chair, Levin.
Thank you so much, uh, my co-chair, Dr. Matthew Eugene, um, and thank you for your work on behalf of human rights here in New York City. Um, and now I would like to um, turn it over to members of the administration for their testimony. Um, we are joined by uh, Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner of the um, Sorry, and I'm, I'm uh, missing the entire title, but uh, Deputy Commissioner, if you could uh, read that into the record when you begin. Uh, also joined by Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater at the Department of Social Services. Um, and let's see, we are, oh, I'm sorry, we are doing, uh, we are doing a public panel first. Excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, sorry about that. We are doing a public panel first. Um, And uh, bear with me, please. Um, oh, and I'm going to call on uh, Councilmember Keith Powers to do a statement uh, uh, before calling on the panel to on his legislation. Thank you. Thank you to both chairs. Uh, my name is City Councilmember Keith Powers, and I'm uh, glad to be here joining my colleagues uh, today and support of this a really important piece of legislation. Um, I'll talk briefly about my bill, but I want to just take a uh, step back to say that this week, this past week, uh, as many of us, including the chair, Steve Levin, have been out there advocating for clearer and better policies with regard to a number of the shelters and um, hotels that have been in the news recently. These bills become even, you know, to me, are a really important part of the equation as we're talking about long-term solutions for homelessness. And as we all talk often about the need to find people housing and find people permanent housing to avoid these community battles over hotels and shelters, we now have an opportunity right here today to do and to do that and to take steps in the pursuit of that uh, goal. So I hope many folks will, who have uh, whatever side you're on will be uh, widely in support of these bills here today. And I have to commend the chair, Steve Levin, because he has been talking about a number of these bills for quite a long time. And I've actually witnessed him fighting with the administration over things like vouchers and making sure that we're doing our part here in the city. But I'm also really glad to join him in the introduction of the Fair Chance Housing Act a few weeks ago, which will offer people a better opportunity to get housing here in New York City. As a chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, we talk about re-entry and we talk about being prepared for getting people permanent housing, which is about stability. And this is a real opportunity to do it. And so um, this bill is, I think, a tremendous step forward if we're able to pass it to actually help people find housing and to, and to remove uh, the box or the, to ban the box here in New York City when it comes to people's criminal history when finding housing. I'm also really uh, proud to introduce a bill that's about sorts of income discrimination here in New York City, something I've talked about for quite a long time. This goes back to when I was working in the assembly some years ago and the Bloomberg administration and us fought over expanding uh, sorts of income discrimination protections. I think they even had the bill vetoed. Um, but right now in New York City, there's prohibitions against discrimination based on law full source of income only apply to buildings with six units or more. That leaves many smaller buildings out where New Yorkers with vouchers who may already struggle to find housing could continue to face discrimination. So the bill that I've been introduced, I've introduced here today, pre the pre-considered bill, would expand protections against source of income discrimination to any housing with more than two units in New York City with an exception for owner-occupied uh, units and buildings. It also brings New York City closer to line with the laws that the state passed recently around source of income discrimination so that we can ensure that New York City can enforce our laws here right here in the city and we can empower our own agencies that are doing a very good job enforcing source of income discrimination to be able to do their job. So I look forward to hearing everybody's comments on that and of course ready to uh, uh, take notes on those to, to address any challenges that might reside within those. But I think these are really important bills that are going to actually help New Yorkers at a time where we desperately need it. I really want to thank everybody here who has been working on these issues far before I came to the city council and have been in pursuit of more just policies and also are standing up for our most vulnerable New Yorkers. And I'll just end on this note, which is that beyond this, at some point, we're going to continue to need to talk about resourcing those agencies, which are 
in um, in, uh, uh, in to have the responsibility for enforcing these laws because I do believe, and I've said this for a while, I think we need some uh, more resources at those agencies where it's possible at a very at a very challenging time in the city around the fiscal uh, crisis. But those agencies do really important work to make sure that folks can get housing. So, with that being said, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. I really want to thank the chair for his endless work and also hosting this hearing to make sure that New Yorkers can get housing and can be uh, uh, make sure that they're not discriminated against and have uh, appropriate vouchers. So thank you, Chair, and I look forward to hearing everybody's testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Council to the Committee and Minta Kilowan um, for the first panel. Thank you, Chair Levin. I am Aminta Kilowan, Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and I'll be calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. At that point, you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists. Please listen for your name to be called. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I'll be periodically announcing who the next panelists are going to be. So the first panelists that we're going to be hearing from today are Charisma White, Chantel Williams, Karim Walker, and Josepha Silva. Again, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask, ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order in which you've raised your hand. I wanna note that we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. That includes both questions and answers. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we won't be allowing a second round of questioning. And again, all public testimony is going to be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. I am going to now call on our first witness for today who will be Charisma White. Time starts now. Okay, it seems as if Charisma may be having, we may be having some technical difficulties. So we will move on to Chantel Williams and we'll get back to Charisma. The time starts now. Hello, good morning. My name is Chantel Williams. This is my second time having a city FEPS voucher, receiving the first due to losing my job. Late payments from HRA got my family evicted from my apartment of five years forcing us into homelessness. I received my second city FEPS voucher from DHS, constantly getting denied for apartments both times because I don't make 40 times the rent. I cannot work due to medical reasons, so why should my occupation matter if I have a voucher that can cover the rent? It shouldn't. But me not knowing my rights got me discriminated against like many others, which is why we need to approve intro bill 1339. Landlords deny me because, quote, by law, we cannot rent a one bedroom to get a four family household with a 1580 city feds voucher. If landlords know this, then the people that create the vouchers, why don't they? It's simple. DHS and HRA does not care and is set up for failure. If they have a lack of care for their rat and roach infested shelters, they won't care to increase our city feds vouchers to help us out. Do you realize the more people you help out of shelters, you can decrease homeless people being on the streets? Here's median asking rent for a studio in the past two years. Queens, 1895, Brooklyn, 1945, Bronx, 1814, Manhattan, $3,888. How is 1580 one bedroom city feds voucher going to cover that? Uh, because the system is not built on common sense, which is why intro bill 146 would help cover realistic asking rent. Please don't delay helping lives and what could be you, or did you not think that this could happen to you? Guess what? This is happening to my four-year-old autistic son. This is happening to my two-year-old daughter and my 12-week baby in my womb. 
after being ripped from their homes for just 20 minutes with no shoes where my baby's feet in 30 degree weather, don't you think they deserve fairness? Don't you? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Chantel. And now we will move on to Karim Walker. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karim Walker. Um, if we could describe New York City in one word, it would be expensive. The city has, as we can see, New York City has a very, very big problem in terms of housing and affordability in housing. That's why uh, intro 146, which would raise the value of the, val value of the vouchers to fair market value is so key to maintaining stability, uh, housing stability in the city. If we can afford approximately, what, if, we, we close, if we can afford about $3,500 a month for a shelter bed for someone to stay in a shelter, I'm sure the city can afford to pay a fraction of that one, $2,000 just to make sure someone has a roof over their head, a stable house, and from that can move on with their lives and what they need to do to make themselves a viable member, a viable and productive member of society. We, as we all know, housing is health is healthcare. Housing is much more than just uh, is more than just a roof over your head. It's a it's a source of pride. It's a force. Of, it's a source of uh, stability. It's a source of respect. And if we can afford, if we can do that, I'm sure a lot of people will make themselves will feel a lot better about themselves. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Karim. And now we will move on to Josefa Silva. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Josefa Silva. I'm from Wynn, and I will be reading testimony from two individuals this morning. My name is Tasha Wells, and I thank the City Council for allowing me to submit testimony. My th three children and I live at the family residence in East New York, which has been our home since November of 2018. Since January of 2019, I have had a City Feps voucher and I have looked everywhere to find a landlord who would take the voucher to allow us to rent an apartment and leave shelter. It's been nearly two years using the voucher. I don't know how many times I have to renew it. It's about to expire again. The search is taking so long because my family and I are looking for a two bedroom apartment. At $15.80 a month, you cannot find anything. At Wynn, I regularly speak with the housing coordinator and I've searched everywhere for an apartment. I call landlords and I reach out to them via text. It's very rare that you find anything for $1,600 and most two bedroom apartments are $1,800 to $2,000 per month. I've gone to a number of viewings. It's very difficult and very competitive. Often there are multiple families looking at the same apartment. It's very hard. I have even looked for one bedroom apartments. I'm willing to do what we have to to move out of shelter and we will make it work. My family and I are appreciative of the city council's dedication to helping homeless families. We came to New York City after surviving two category five hurricanes in the US Virgin Islands. Our family, like so many, lost everything in those storms and have had to start over. Finding a permanent home would be even more important for my family because it would allow me to get the medical care that I need in order to go back to work. I'm on dialysis and need treatment three days per week but I cannot get a transplant until my doctors feel that I'll be able to get three months of round the clock care. I need a home so that I can get the care I need. I've applied for supportive housing, but it's a very long wait list. Finding a home and getting a transplant would be a new start. In the US Virgin Islands, I worked as a program coordinator on HIV prevention, reaching out to women and girls about health and safety. I would someday like to return to working in public health. Having a voucher that pays more would make those dreams possible and provide a more stable home for my three children. I ask you today to please pass intro 146 so that I can find an apartment for my family. May I ask for time to start for a second testimony? Yes, Josefa, you can, you can do that. Thank you. My name is Corey Darby and I thank the City Council for allowing me to submit testimony. I'm calling on the City Council to pass intro 146. We will ensure that City FEP's um, rent amount is always competitive and can allow families to move out of shelter. I work as a housing coordinator at Wynn. Next month, I will celebrate 24 years working at the Wynn Bay Family Shelter in Sheepshead Bay. Our shelter is home to 96 families, and I regularly work with about 35 families at a time to try to find new apartments. 
As a housing coordinator, I help families apply for vouchers, search apartment listings on Craigslist and Zillow, attend showings, negotiate with landlords, and navigate the major aspects of the housing search. Finding an apartment with a voucher is already a long and difficult process. As part of my job, I regularly drive around Brooklyn neighborhoods, and when I see for rent signs, I take down the contact information and call the brokers to see if they can help us find apartments for our clients. It's very difficult to find apartments that are listed for the rents that fit amounts that homeless families can afford. But finding an apartment is even more difficult with the CityFAPS voucher because the maximum rent available is so low. It is incredibly challenging to find a studio or one-bedroom apartment for $1,323 a month. It's even more difficult to try to help a family of three or a family of four to find an apartment for $1,580 a month. Many of the landlords I meet who are looking for renters for a studio or one bedroom can get $1,800 or $1,900 a month. Expecting them to take below market rates to house formerly homeless families is not realistic. So it's extremely rare that our clients are able to find an apartment within the 90 days of eligibility for using the city FAPS voucher. Many of our clients reapply for the voucher multiple times. This leads to a frustrating cycle for our families. Many feel that as soon as they get the voucher, they will be able to move out of shelter quickly. But the long search often means they get depressed in their situation. Many do not realize how hard it is to search for an apartment with city thefts, and they get frustrated just at the moment when they are so close to finding stable homes. On many more occasions, our families get close to finding a home only to have apartments fall through, largely because the amount of the rental voucher isn't enough to keep a landlord committed. It hurts me as a housing coordinator to see families get close and then have their hopes dashed. They're often looking at me for the answers. I get frustrated for them, and I get frustrated for my colleagues at Wynn who are also looking for answers. The City FAPS voucher program has a number of advantages, including families, including allowing families to receive help until their oldest child is 21. But at its current rent levels, it is not a useful tool for helping families exit. Please, please pass intro 146 to help homeless families exit shelter more quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Josefa, and I apologize for having mispronounced your name. Oh, that's okay. And now we are going to again call on Charisma White. I start now. Hello, my name is Charisma White. I'm an HPD Section 8 voucher holder for over 10 years now. I experienced a very harsh and alarming ordeal when looking for a home with a very serious medical problem. I was homeless for three years in New York City while holding a pretty reliable good voucher. Management and landlords and realtors would tell me they are not accepting vouchers or your income is not high enough or your credit is not good enough. Increasing the voucher amount will make a difference in providing community and homes for people that are formerly homeless. Please Increase the voucher amount on the city FEPS vouchers, intro 146. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charisma. And again, I apologize for mispronouncing your name as well. I'm doing the best that I can. I'd now like to call on the attendee who has dialed in to our hearing today. If you can please identify yourself for the record. My name is Ashley Belcher. Thank you, Ashley. You may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Good morning, members of the City Council. My name is Ashley Belcher, and I'm with the Homeless Can't Stay Home campaign. I'm 27 years old, and I've been homeless for about 11 years. I feel that Intro 146 is a huge deal for the future success of street homeless and sheltered people of New York. Push for 146 so we're out of the mix. I believe and know from past experience, Intro 146 could potentially give homeless people more confidence and protection by providing them with housing. Housing allows people to have their own space and cleanliness. Ultimately, I say this because I want you to understand that housing will give us a life of our own. I know I can speak for most of us when I say the current voucher value is much less than what's affordable or substantial living means in New York. 
It's virtually impossible to find, vouch to find housing with the voucher at its current rate. By helping us with this increase, I can guarantee there will be more people off the street and it will allow myself and others to feel like a normal residents and participants in our communities. It will give us an opportunity and confidence to become a working member of society. In conclusion, by raising the city thefts vouchers to fair market rate, we will have an actual chance in getting permanent housing. Currently at this rate and amount, there is not much hope for finding a home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. And this concludes our first panel for this morning. I'd now like to turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much, Minta. Thank you to this panel. Um, and I, as you can see, I have my one-year-old here. So um, he's, I apologize in advance if you hear some, you know, crying or if I have to run off screen for a minute. Um, uh, I just want to thank this panel um, for, um, uh, you know, the, the, your perseverance um, and for um, sharing your story with us in very real terms so that we can understand that it's not just a bunch of numbers and it's not just, um, you know, uh, uh, we're not talking about abstract policy here. Um, this is real. Um, this has been real for a long time. Um, and so I just want to thank all of you so much for your testimony. And just, Jose, if I remember, um, gosh, a couple of years now, um, I, I was, I went to meet with the housing coordination staff at Wynn to talk about, and they said, I know what we need. We need more, we need more uh, housing coordinators. That's, that'll, that'll fix the problem. We need more housing coordinators. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I went to uh, talk with that about that with um, with Wynn staff, and and they said we don't actually need more housing coordinators. We need an increase in the voucher amount because um, you can have you could triple the number of housing coordinators, but if um, if the voucher limits are not uh, raised to fair market rent, um, people will still face the same problem. So um, uh, I just want to thank all of you um, for for uh, keeping this. Um, the progress going on this. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Antonio Reynoso, who's joined us as well, um, uh, Councilmember Reynoso from Brooklyn. And there are two uh, council members, um, or there's one council member that has a question uh, for this panel, I believe, uh, Council Member Barron. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I want to thank the chairs for having this very important hearing and thank the panel for sharing their personal experiences. And I'd like to be added to that, led to those bills on which I'm not already a member uh, listed as a sponsor, co sponsor. And the issue that we're facing in terms of homelessness is so critical. We know that uh, the, everyone is entitled to decent, affordable housing. And the temporary shelters are not the solution. And we are seeing now, uh, just last week, what are the consequences of people being in temporary shelters and being in locations where people have basically a NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard. So we know that on the Upper West Side, the residents there hired a high powered attorney and subsequently the men that were housed at the Lucerne were uh, evicted. And that's having a trickle effect. And the family residents in my community, I don't know if it's the same one where testimony was entered into the record, but there's a family residence here in East New York where the residents have been told they have to vacate. We're going to be holding a press conference in about an hour saying, no, this system needs to be corrected. We need to make all the provisions we can to get people into permanent housing. We don't want to have a juggling and a domino effect and a ripple effect because you're moving people uh, because of community opposition and then displacing another location of people. We know that family shelters are also very, very important and it provides a sense of stability in the community and for those who are there, particularly now during this pandemic and with the issues that we have regarding opening of schools. So I support 
the legislation. I asked to be added to that. And I want to offer words of encouragement to all of those who are caught up in this shelter system and just say that don't be discouraged. Keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Seeing no other questions from council members for this panel, I will now call on members of the administration to testify. I'm gonna now read off the names of the individuals who are going to be testifying. For DSS, we have Bruce Jordan, Chief Homelessness Prevention Officer, Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs. For the Commission on Human Rights, we have Dana Sessman, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, and Zoe Chinitz, Senior Policy Counsel. At this time, I am going to deliver the oath to the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. 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 Thank you all. You may begin your testimony when ready. Good morning, Chairs Levin and Eugene, and members of the General Welfare and Civil Human Rights Committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the topic of rental assistance and source of income discrimination programs. My name is Bruce Jordan, and I am the Chief Homelessness Prevention Officer at the Human Resources Administration, HRA. And I am joined by Eric Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Social Services, DSS. The Homelessness Prevention Administration's mission is to keep New Yorkers stably housed and ensure they are connected to resources like rental assistance and legal services. Within the Homelessness Prevention Administration of the Housing and Homeless Services Initiative Division, the Rental Assistance Program, the Legal Services Initiatives Unit, and the Early Intervention Outreach Team, all of which are vital partners in assisting New Yorkers in need and contributing to the first pillar of the Mayor's Turning the Tide Plan to prevent homelessness wherever possible. A system built upon, excuse me, a system built over time against the backdrop of affordable housing scarcity, structural inequality, and severely rent burdened New Yorkers. The reforms and initiatives we are implementing are taking hold despite prior decades of underinvestment in affordable housing and rental assistance. DSS serves 3 million clients each year. Poverty and homelessness are often attributed to individual decision-making and individual circumstances rather than underlying structural inequality. However, structural inequality is a reality for the families and individuals we serve every day. We are making progress. Our census for 2017, 2018, and 2019 has remained flat year over year for the first time in more than a decade at approximately 60,000. Today, the New York City Department of Homeless Services census is fewer than 55,000, but we still have much work to do to address the problems that built up over many years. As I begin my testimony, it's important, it is important to briefly provide some historical context. From 1994 to 2014, the shelter population in New York City increased 115%. And between 2011 and 2014, Following the abrupt end of the Advantage Rental Assistance Program, the DHS shelter census increased by 38%. During the same time, New York City faced increasing economic inequality as a result of stagnant wages, a lack of affordable housing, and an increased cost of living. Rents increased by more than 18%, while wages increased by less than 5%. And 150,000 rent-regulated apartments were lost. Combined, these and other trends meant that by 2015, the city only had half the housing it needed for about 3 million low-income New Yorkers. And while the city's rental vacancy rate of 5% poses a problem for people across all incomes, renters who are only able to afford an apartment costing 800 or less must search in a market with a vacancy rate of a mere 1.15% in 2017, down from 1.8% in 2014. Today, roughly three out of every 10 New York City renters are severely rent burdened, spending more than 50% of their income on rent. 
Many of these individuals and families facing rent burden are also those who cycle in and out of poverty, living just one personal crisis away from homelessness. COVID-19 has only exacerbated this crisis. The prevention, preventing homelessness whenever we can, a prevention first model has been key to addressing the homeless crisis that has built up over four decades by stopping homelessness in the first place. Our prevention model includes three key initiatives, an expansion of the network of neighborhood-based home-based offices in all five boroughs, and universal access to counsel through the Civil Office of Justice and rental assistance. Homebase is a community-based prevention program and serves as the first point of entry for those at risk of becoming homeless. Under this administration, we expanded the number of home-based locations from 14 in 2014 to 26 in 2020. This expansion increased access so that people can be served close to home. At these locations, our contracted providers work with families and individuals to determine the prevention and diversion tools for which they are eligible, including on-site processing and triaging for public assistance and rental assistance, landlords and family mediation, educational advancement, employment opportunities, and financial literacy services. The numbers of households served by home base in, two, in FY20 was 28,700, almost tripling the 11,900 households served in fiscal 14. Through home base, we also increased access to payment of emergency rent and utility arrears to assist New Yorkers at risk of eviction remaining in their homes and to, in, to cover the increasing cost of rent. To date, this administration has provided emergency rent arrears to approximately 50,000 households each fiscal year since FY15 and over a quarter million grants to households since 2014. The average payment per case between July 2019 to April 2020 was 4,231. We also made the payment process more efficient and quicker by replacing the old system of generating checks at each individual HRA job center with a centralized rent arrears processing unit. Moreover, we have implemented an electronic benefits payment system for housing authority rent arrears payments, and we are developing a similar payment system for private landlords. Using Access HRA, clients can confirm that the rent was paid to their landlords and reform we work to codify in state law. Under this administration, we exponentially expanded free legal services for New Yorkers facing eviction and landlord harassment. Funding for legal services for tenants increased more than 20-fold since 2014, roughly 6 million to more than 128 million currently, growing to 166 million in the baseline budget when the right to counsel program is implemented fully. With this investment, residential evictions by marshals declined by 41% since 2013. In 2019 alone, evictions decreased by 15%, the largest single year decrease since the launch of the city's universal access to counsel program. In FY19, OCJ funded legal organizations provided legal assistance to over 41,000 households across New York City facing housing challenges, compromising over, comprising over 105,000 tenants and their household members. This reflected a 24% increase in households served compared to the prior year and a 74% increase compared to FY17. Before the formal launch of Universal Access, as of December 2019, nearly 400,000 New Yorkers received free legal representation, advice or assistance in eviction and other housing related matters since 2014 through tenant legal service programs administered by the Human Resource Administration's Office of Civil Justice in the Homelessness Prevention Unit. Rental assistance, streamlined programs, policy process changes. HRA's rental assistance programs help individuals and families move out of shelter or avoid homelessness by providing monthly rental supplements, which bridge the gap between rent and income. After the city and state cut the Advantage Rental Assistance Program in 2011, homelessness grew by an additional 38%. Upon taking office in 2014, this administration jumped in aggressively to fill the gap and rebuilt rental assistance and rehousing programs from scratch in order to provide families and individuals with the vital support needed to secure housing or remain housed today. HRA's rental assistance programs are a critical component of a multi-pronged social service strategy that responds to unmet affordable housing supply needs. In 2018, HRA streamlined city-funded rental assistance programs for households in or at risk of going into shelter, 
collapsing seven unique programs into one, making it easier for landlords and clients alike. The City FEPS program design is consistent with the settlement with the state in Tejeda with respect to state FEPS. We recognize, excuse me one second, please technical difficulties. We recognize rental assistance as a critical tool to move families and individuals out of shelter and to vert entry into shelter. City FEPS is entirely funded through city tax levy. To be eligible for city FEPS, households must have a gross income at or below 200% of the federal poverty level and meet one of the following five criteria. The household includes someone who served in the U.S. Armed Forces and is at risk of homelessness, or the household has an unexpired link City FEPS or SEPS letter at the time of City FEPS eligibility is requested, not available after 2-28-2019, or the household gets link six or pathway home benefits and would be eligible for City FEPS if they were in a DHS or HRA shelter, or the household was referred by a City FEPS qualifying program and DSS determined that City FEPS was needed to avoid shelter entry, or the household is facing eviction in court or was evicted in the past and include someone who has previously lived in a DHS shelter or include someone who has an active adult protective services, APS case, and is designated community guardianship program or lives in a rent control apartment and will use city FEPS to stay in that apartment. One of the goals of streamlining multiple rental assistance programs was to increase our ability to combat discrimination faced by prospective renters using subsidized vouchers in the housing market referred to as source of income discrimination. The streamlining of rental assistance programs has resulted in more landlords and brokers opening doors for our neighbors in need, while also enabling HRA to better track and attack SOI discrimination. Fair Housing Litigation Unit, FHLU. The process of securing a rental assistance voucher is an important first step towards achieving permanent housing for our clients. Searching for an apartment in New York City can be arduous for many people However, it is particularly difficult when some landlords are actively discriminating against you based on your source of income. In New York City, it is illegal for landlords or real estate brokers to refuse to rent to current or prospective tenants who use any form of public assistance to pay their rent, including Section 8, Supplemental Security Income SSI, HIV AIDS Services Administration, HASA, Family Homelessness and Eviction Prevention Supplement, FEPS, City FEPS, among others. It is also unlawful for landlords and housing agents to publish any type of advertisements refusing to accept these programs, including online or print. In May of 2017, the Department of Social Services, DSS, Source of Income Discrimination Unit, SOI, was established to combat illegal practices that prevent New Yorkers from securing housing opportunities. Today, the unit has been expanded and renamed the Fair Housing Litigation Unit. This unit's primary focus remains combating source of income discrimination, but it has been renamed in recognition of the fact that SOI discrimination is often intertwined with other forms of discrimination. The unit works to prevent and prosecute instances of housing discrimination based on lawful source of income via a multi-pronged approach that includes education and outreach, pre-complaint intervention, investigations, and filing and prosecuting complaints on behalf of the city alleging a pattern or practice of source of income discrimination. When other forms of discrimination are identified in an SOI case, the unit will take steps to address those issues as well. On behalf of renters utilizing rental assistance, the Fair Housing Litigation Unit takes decisive legal action against landlords, including in New York State Supreme Court. For discrimination based on sources of income, by intervening whenever and wherever those seeking housing may encounter barriers in the housing process from inquiry and application through lease signing. The unit's creation sends a powerful message to city landlords that refuse to rent to New Yorkers receiving public assistance to pay their rent. We are here to work with all landlords but will not stand for discrimination. We have lawyers working to address this illegal discriminatory behavior and we are prepared to intervene and prosecute to ensure all New Yorkers can access the housing opportunities that are rightfully theirs as they get back on their feet. Coupled with our rental assistance programs, DSS Source of Income Discrimination Unit has proven to be a formidable tool in fighting housing discrimination, fueling homelessness in our city. FHLU prevents and prosecutes instances of housing discrimination using a multi-pronged approach. 
education and outreach. The unit provides training on fair housing across the five boroughs for legal service providers, not for profit, community based organizations, tenant advocacy groups, and DSS, HRA, and DHS staff. The unit will also address advocate inquiries relating to fair hearing concerns. Pre complaint intervention, the unit reviews complaints and, as appropriate, conducts interventions, including negotiation, negotiating with brokers and landlords in leasing for any city resident seeking tenancy. Robust fair housing testing and investigations. The unit manages an extensive citywide testing operation that will use secret shoppers to identify all types of housing discrimination. Filing and prosecuting complaints on behalf of the city alleging pattern or practice discrimination. Through a, des through a designation from the New York City Law Department, the unit is authorized to file cases alleging pattern or practice discrimination on behalf of the city. Since its establishment, FHLU, DSS, SOI unit filed several cases against landlords in New York State Supreme Court for discrimination based on source of income. In June 2018, the unit filed its first two cases against New York City landlords in New York Supreme Court, New York State Supreme Court, for discrimination based on source of income. In the first case, City of New York versus St. Mark's Hamilton LLC and Oxford Realty Group LLC, property management company Oxford Realty told multiple callers seeking housing that vouchers were not accepted at the Seaview State's rental apartment complex in Staten Island. In the second case, City of New York versus Everton Campbell, Atlas Realty Associates, Inc., DSS initiated an investigation that found advertisements containing discriminatory language for units located in the Bronx being published on multiple real estate websites, including apartmentfinder.com, hotpads.com, and apartments.com. The discriminatory language included phrases as, such as not accepting any vouchers, no vouchers are being accepted for this apartment, and this apartment is not accepting any vouchers. In July of 2019, the, deal, the DSS SOI unit filed its third case in the New York State Supreme Court for discrimination based on source of income. In this case, City of New York versus Sampson Management LLC, 700 Victory Boulevard, Newhouse Realty Inc and Lee Lu and Lily Lu, an investigation found that only Lily Lu, the exclusive broker for the Parkview Apartments, a 200 plus unit building on Staten Island owned by 700 Victory Boulevard LLC and managed by Samson Management LLC was systematically denying housing opportunities to prospective tenants with vouchers by failing to follow up with them regarding available apartments while following up with non-voucher holders regarding the same apartments. Samson Management LLC owns or manages over 5,000 residential units across New York City and has been the subject of multiple federal investigations and class action lawsuits regarding discrimination for decades. This case was initiated by the Fair Hearing Litigation Unit, developed solely through in-house capabilities and then referred to the Fair Housing Justice Center, FHJC, for additional field testing required to initiate litigation. The Fair Housing Litigation Unit takes action on matters received via intake referral as well as unit initiated investigations, pursuing litigation where a pattern and practice of SOI discrimination is uncovered. Litigation is a necessary tool that the unit brings to the table, but is considered a tool of last resort. As the unit's top priority is helping DSS clients utilizing rental assistance to secure housing, we do this through immediate rapid response intervention in individual cases of SOI discrimination, leveraging all housing placement assistance and social service tools that the Department of Social Services brings to bear to help New Yorkers in need get back on their feet. The unit's first and fastest goal is turning a no into a yes, so that New Yorkers in search of housing can be connected to that housing swiftly in order to stabilize their lives and maintain stability. At DSS HRA, we understand an intentional policies and practices perpetuate segregation and inequity across the country and in our city. And it will take concerted effort from all levels of government, working with our partners in the private and non-private sectors to undo that legacy. Breaking trajectory and headed in the right direction, beginning to reverse the trend. While the devastating impacts of economic inequality and past inaction from prior administrations led to the homeless crisis we face today, the initiatives of the Department of Social Services, HRA and DHS, are beginning to reverse the trend. 
After nearly four decades of an ever-increasing homeless population in New York City, we have broken the trajectory of growth in the homeless census and the new programs, reforms, and investments we are implementing are headed in the right direction. Currently, the DHS census is 54,490 in comparison to 59,561 a year ago, with the number of children and adults in DHS shelters for families with children at its lowest point of 10,404 families, with 32,194 individuals in these families since December 2012, 34,497. Over the past months, we've been closely monitoring the census and what we've seen in a steady decline in family homelessness and a steady increase in the single adult homelessness as COVID-19 has magnified the realities of housing instability for single adults in New York City. In a five month period from November 2019 to April 2020, the numbers of New Yorkers who have moved out of shelter into permanent housing or remained in their homes as a result of our rental assistance programs and supports increased by 9% from 139,328 to 147,700. And through June of 2020, we have assisted more than 150,000 individuals move out of the shelter or avoid entry into shelter. While we know there's still much work to be done, the data shows that our strategies to address the crisis has built, that has built up over 40 years are beginning to take hold. For example, prevention first. We are keeping more New Yorkers in their homes by expanding access to legal services through our first in the nation right to counsel program for eviction cases, with evictions by Marshall pre-COVID dropping by 41% since 2013, while evictions are up all across the country. Rehousing helped more than 150,000 New Yorkers move out of shelters or avoid homelessness altogether through our rental assistance and rehousing programs. Even in the midst of the COVID pandemic, HRA has continued to focus on permanent housing placements, which are the best long-term option for our clients. We have rolled out a virtual walkthrough permanent housing inspection process to continue move outs. We are also creating new housing opportunities for households experiencing homelessness through master leasing and collaboration with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Now we'll move on to legislation. Intro 146. This bill will require that any individuals or families receiving rental assistance vouchers established by the Department of Social Services will continue to receive the assistance so long as the household continues to meet any other eligibility requirements. The bill would also require that the maximum rent towards which rental assistance vouchers may be applied annually increases at the same rate as the fair market rents set by the United States Department of Housing Preservation and Development. The requirements set by the bill would be subject to appropriation. As we have testified to, our rental assistance programs are one of many tools used to address homelessness and housing instability. Every year, thousands of households exit shelter with a voucher or receive vouchers in the community. Tens of thousands of households are currently using vouchers. Raising the FMR will increase the cost of these vouchers, but not generate savings. And that cost grows over time as the previously placed population renews leases at the higher rent. Additionally, raising the cost above the value of state rental assistance could inadvertently lead to property owners unlawfully playing favorites by picking the higher value city vouchers over state vouchers. We are concerned about fiscal implications given, given the current budget realities facing the city. Consistency across programs help prevent source of income discrimination and ensure equal opportunity for voucher holders trying to get back on their feet. Intro 2018, this bill will require, excuse me one second. This bill will require the Department of Homeless Services, DHS, to provide services to domestic violence survivors in all DHS shelters. Services will be coordinated by a social worker. We look forward to working with the sponsor to address the goals of this legislation. And we anticipate that there will be discussions at a staff level concerning any legal issues that may be implicated by this bill. DHS works very closely with HRA's domestic violence programs, as well as the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. Our chief priority is to ensure clients are able to access services in confidential locations and to ensure strong pathways for referrals, including those to the New York City Families Justice Centers, FJCs, and to diverse network of community-based providers. 
intro 1020, this bill will require that the Department of Homeless Services and the Human Resource Administration track and report certain data regarding rental assistance programs, including outcomes of family homelessness and eviction prevention supplement, FEPS, and any future rental assistance program created for New York City residents. We are interested in working with the sponsor to address the goal and intent of the legislation. The agency already submits regularized reports to the city council at each fiscal plan as agreed upon in the monitor's report concerning rental assistance. Intro 1339, this bill will require the New York City Department of Social Services, DSS, to arrange for the provision of a written notice to applicants who are found potentially eligible for rental assistance programs administered by DSS. The notice will provide information about protections under the New York City human rights law related to discrimination on the basis of a person's lawful source of income. We support the goal of this legislation and want to work with the sponsor to align with our current work. DSS currently has information about protections under the New York City human rights law related to discrimination on the basis of a person's lawful source of income, and SOI, info, is included on a city FEP shopping letter. Pre-considered T2020-6576. This bill will require the Department of Social Services, DSS, to provide more information about its rental assistance program, City FEPS online. Specifically, DSS would be required to make the status of an application or renewal request available to applicants online. DSS looks forward to working with the sponsor on this legislation. Currently, DSS provides a great deal of information to clients through Access HRA. We currently have an RFP in the field to continue to improve this tool. Given procurement rules, we are limited in what we can discuss today. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan. I just want to note for members of the public that there's no need to use the raise hand function. Again, there's no need to raise your hand as we will be calling on you throughout the hearing. Please listen for your name. The raise hand function is specifically for council members who wish to ask questions. And now we will move to Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater. I don't have additional testimony for the agency. We can move to CCHR now. Thank, thank, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. So we will move on to Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the Commission on Human Rights. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levin, Chair Eugene, and members of the Committees on General Welfare and Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing and for your commitment to improving access to affordable, fair housing in our city. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Senior Policy Counsel Zoe Chenitz. We will be testifying today in support of the pre-considered unnumbered bill that would expand source of income protections under the city human rights law, and also in support of intro 2047, which would prohibit housing discrimination based on arrest or a criminal record. My testimony will focus primarily on the proposed expansion of source of income protections and the Commission's work in this area. As you likely know, the Commission is the local civil rights enforcement agency that enforces the New York City human rights law, one of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country, now totaling 27 protected categories across nearly all aspects of city living housing, employment, and public accommodations, in addition to discriminatory harassment and bias-based profiling by law enforcement. By statute, the commission has two main functions. First, the commission's law enforcement bureau enforces the city human rights law by investigating complaints of discrimination from the public, initiating its own investigations on behalf of the city, and utilizing its in-house testing program to help identify entities breaking the law. Second, the Community Relations Bureau, which, comprises the, uh, which is comprised of community service centers in each of the city's five boroughs. Um, the commission provides free workshops on individuals' rights and, um, and employers, businesses, and housing providers' obligations under the city human rights law and creates programming and outreach on human rights and civil rights issues. In the last five and a half years, since Commissioner and Chair Carmelyn Malalas began her tenure, the Commission has implemented 31 amendments to the city human rights law, including the nation's broadest ban the box criminal history discrimination protections in employment, the nation's first salary history ban, 
and expansions of protections and new requirements related to sexual harassment and lactation accommodations, among many others. The Commission's work has not paused because of the COVID-19 pandemic. To the contrary, our work has continued, expanded, and pivoted to address current challenges, including racial disparities in access to healthcare, housing, and essential needs, the needs of frontline workers who have disabilities or who are pregnant and need accommodations to continue to do their job safety, safely, and the rise in anti-Asian bias and discrimination. As we just announced yesterday, the Commission has assessed a record $7.5 million in damages and penalties for violations of the city human rights law in fiscal year 2020. This represents a 550% increase in damages and penalties since Commissioner Malalas took over the agency in 2015. These figures exceed damages and penalties in the last fiscal year by 18% and, near, and represent nearly double the damages and penalties compared to fiscal year 2018. Further, the Commission works to resolve cases not just for monetary relief in the form of damages and penalties, but has applied creative approaches informed by restorative justice, offering to repair the harm experienced by individuals and communities impacted by the discrimination. For example, this year, the Commission has negotiated resolution, resolutions that require respondents to invest in paid internship, apprenticeship, or employment pipeline opportunities for underrepresented groups, and to create new high-level positions to oversee such efforts and to engage with community-based organizations to recruit workers or prospective tenants. And the Commission has maintained the cooperative approach to businesses and public accommodations it established five years ago, in many instances involving first-time violators of the city human rights law where there is no complainant harmed by the violation. The Commission has sought to educate businesses about their legal obligations and work with them in creating non-discriminatory policies and practices rather than levying bracing fines. Many small business owners and landlords themselves experience different forms of discrimination in other areas of their lives. And our approach in certain situations to educate rather than penalize has greater impact in furthering the understanding and adoption of human rights in this city. While assessing a record number, a record level of damages and penalties, the commission also closed a new high of 1,066 cases and reduced the average case processing time by 100 days, an incredibly challenging feat, especially under current circumstances and within a telework environment. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau this, this past fiscal year filed 525 new cases and completed 403 successful emergency interventions. The Commission settled 267 cases and completed 43 mediations, both representing increases from the, from the prior fiscal year. These increases are a testament to the dedication of the Commission's staff, who remain steadfast in their efforts to vindicate New Yorkers' human rights, though many of our own staff have lost parents, grandparents, and other family members in the last few months, and or were forced to contend with pandemic-related challenges for themselves and their families. The agency also received an increased number of reports of discrimination in fiscal year 2020, from 9,804 in fiscal year 2019, to 10,015 in fiscal year 20. Consistent with past years, the protected categories of disability, gender, and race were the top three most reported areas of discrimination. I'm now going to um, highlight the commission's work, longstanding work on combating source of income discrimination. Combating discrimination based on lawful source of income has been a major priority for Commissioner Malalas since the very beginning of her tenure. In her first year, the Commission quadrupled the number of investigations into lawful source of income, filing 90 cases, a 300% increase from the prior year's 22 cases. In 2016, the Commission issued its highest civil penalty in a source of income discrimination case in Commission history, fining Best Apartments Incorporated, a management company with control over more than 1,000 units throughout the city, $100,000 for refusing to show a prospective tenant an apartment after he revealed he had a Section 8 voucher. In January 2017, the Commission announced five Commission-initiated cases filed against large landlords and brokers that collectively controlled approximately 20,000 units for repeatedly discriminating against prospective tenants based on their use of housing vouchers, a violation of the city human rights law. The complaints, which the Commission filed on behalf of the city, followed proactive commission-led investigations developed from tips from prospective tenants, as well as the commission's testing program. The landlords and brokerage firms charged with discriminatory practices include Parkchester, 
River Park, Goldfarb, Martini, and ABECO, or Abeco Management. Then, in 2018, the Commission announced the launch of a groundbreaking dedicated source of income unit to provide rapid response advocacy and interventions for people experiencing discrimination while seeking housing using vouchers. The unit undertakes emergency interventions to stop discrimination in its tracks. Our staff contacts the landlords or brokers who are in danger of violating the city human rights law directly to educate them and advocate for the rights of tenants. In the last two fiscal years, the unit has completed 400 emerge, over 400 emergency interventions on behalf of New Yorkers with housing vouchers, which includes getting them into housing they had been denied, along with filing nearly 150 cases and conducting testing and commission initiated investigations. Since 2014, the commission has assessed over $1.2 million in damages and penalties in source of income cases, of which over 450,000 were assessed in fiscal year 2020 alone. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau has taken an expansive approach to address landlords' use of other requirements, like minimum income requirements and credit checks, to exclude voucher holders. In 2018, the Commission published materials that explicitly prohibit the use of credit checks when a voucher covers 100% of the rent. In addition, the Commission's materials also state that where the tenant's rental portion is calculated based on the tenant's income, it is a violation of the city human rights law to impose any additional income requirements on applicants for housing. The commission's materials, which include three separate documents with specific frequently asked question, questions targeted to landlords, brokers and agents, and voucher holders are available in multiple languages on our website. And earlier this year, based on a case the commission initially brought, a New York state appeals court held that vouchers for security deposits are as the commission had asserted, a lawful source of income and landlords must therefore accept them. The commission brought the case in 2017 against the LaFrac organization on behalf of a woman who was denied an, an apartment because she was seeking to use a security voucher to pay the security deposit. The commission's case built on a prior decision and order issued by Commissioner Malalas, finding that the denial of a prospective tenant security voucher was source of income discrimination. The appellate court decision ensures that security vouchers can continue to be administered by HRA and individuals who use them are protected under the city human rights law. In the last fiscal year, the commission has pioneered a new requirement in law in source of income discrimination resolutions, mandating that landlords found to have violated the city human rights law source of income protections reserve or set aside a specific number of units in their housing stock for voucher holders. This novel strategy applies the Commission's commitment to restorative justice to source of income discrimination cases. Not only does it repair the harm to the impacted complainant by ensuring they obtain housing along with damages, but it also creates a structural response to the broader crisis of access to housing for voucher holders and reduces the likelihood of future tenants facing the same kind of discrimination. This new approach was just profiled in an article in the Gothamist last week, and I encourage um, the council members to um, check out that article if you haven't already and hear some of the stories of the complainants that, that were helped. Um, I highlight now several um, case resolutions. Um, this is just a small sample of the many um, that the commission has worked on, the commission staff has worked on over the past years. In June 2020, a complainant, a Section 8 recipient, filed a complaint alleging that her landlord refused to allow her to begin using her Section 8 voucher after she became eligible for the voucher during her tenancy. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau investigation revealed that respondents intentionally failed to process the legally required paperwork for her voucher. After the Law Enforcement Bureau issued a probable cause finding, the parties entered into a conciliation agreement in which the respondents agreed to pay complainant $15,000 in emotional distress damages, waive over $14,000 in rent arrears and other fees, train employees with job duties related to reviewing or evaluating rental applications, and re revise their tenant screening policies, and display the commission's fair housing poster at any and all of their buildings in their portfolio. And another settlement from February 2020, in a prospective tenant who recently, who had received rental assistance through Section 8, filed a complaint alleging that a broker would not allow her to apply for an apartment because of a rental voucher. At the time, the complainant was a homeless mother. Respondents cooperated fully with the commission's investigation. 
complainant and respondents entered into a conciliation agreement requiring respondents to pay $25,000 in emotional distress damages and lost housing opportunity damages to complainant and $15,000 in civil penalties. Respondents also updated their policies on source of income discrimination and agreed to attend an anti-discrimination training. In October 2019, the commission settled a case involving source of income discrimination by Michael Partridge Realty Corporation in which a frontline staffer told a prospective tenant that vouchers were not accepted. The commission negotiated $5,000 in emotional distress damages to the victim and ordered anti-discrimination training by the, for the respondents and creation of an anti-discrimination policy. And finally, in August of 2019, the commission ordered a landlord with 15 buildings to pay $20,000 in emotional distress damages and $4,000 in civil penalties for refusing to accept a prospective tenant's Section 8 voucher. The tenant had lost her voucher as a result of discrimination and had to seek alternative housing options. In addition to her voucher restoration, the landlord agreed to train all employees with job duties related to reviewing and accepting prospective tenants and to post to the Commission's Fair Housing poster in all of their buildings in New York City. My testimony now includes a chart that, inc that shows the numbers of inquiries, complaints, commission-initiated investigations, and successful pre-complaint interventions from calendar years 2015, 2016, 2017, and fiscal years 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, I won't go over all of these numbers, but if people are interested, our, the, this testimony will be posted on the Commission's website um, later today, and, and we can share those. The Commission's Commission, Community Relations Bureau has also engaged in deep community outreach and engagement to educate New Yorkers on their rights to be free from discrimination based on lawful source of income. During Fair Housing Month each year, the Commission hosts a symposium, and over the past several years, source of income discrimination has been a key focus. We've built relationships with community-based organizations doing critical work on the ground who make direct connections to our team and help us spread the work about our work, including Neighbors Together, Housing Court Answers, Community Action for Safe Apartments, Legal Hand, Nazareth House, Part of the Solution, Asian Americans for Equality, St. Nick's Alliance Community Development Corporation, Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, North Brooklyn Housing Task Force, and Met Council. In fiscal year 2020, the commission conducted over 40 fair housing workshops, held seven on-site in-community mobile housing rights clinics, and participated in over 50 additional fair housing related events. The commission supports the proposal to reduce the current six unit minimum for jurisdiction on source of income cases to three units. Which will, which will help ensure access for New Yorkers with vouchers to a broader range of affordable housing stock. As you may be aware, last year, New York State passed source of income protections statewide that are broader than current protections under the city human rights law, and we support more closely aligning the two statutes. I will turn it over to my colleague Zoe Chenitz to discuss intro 2047. Thank you for the opportunity today. And I just wanna express gratitude as well to the first panel um, that brought to life um, so many, uh, so much of the work that um, that we are all trying to address, and um, it is not easy to speak about one's personal experience. And, and I'm very, I am deeply grateful that I had the opportunity to hear their stories today. Um, the commission believes that access for all New Yorkers to affordable housing, free from discrimination, is key to the city's well-being, and we look forward to working with the council um, to further on these bills. Thank you. So Chenitz, you may, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Levin and Eugene and members of the General Welfare Committee and the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing. I am Zoe Chenitz, Senior Policy Counsel at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and I am pleased to represent the Commission today in support of Intro 2047, which would amend the New York City Human Rights Law to prohibit most housing providers from inquiring about and discriminating against applicants based on their arrest or conviction history. Intro 2047 aligns with the Commission's long-standing commitment to racial justice and greater social equity. As we have been reminded by recent events, including the public health crisis caused by the pandemic and widespread social activism seeking to end systemic racism, too frequently disparities in our city play out along lines of race, whether we are talking about issues of poverty access to health care, health outcomes, food security, or involvement in the criminal legal system. 
policies like Intro 2047 have been enacted in cities across the country. They are growing in popularity because cities recognize that given the long history of racial discrimination in the criminal legal system, arrest or conviction histories ought not to bar people from accessing stable housing for themselves and their families. Policies like this one represent a step toward ensuring that whether they are recently returning to their communities from custody or if their records are older, New Yorkers with arrest and conviction histories and their families are given the best possible opportunity to thrive. Our conversations with residents and advocates in communities across the city consistently reaffirm the desire for such support. Our support for this legislation also stems from the commission's long track record of enforcing protections in the employment context for New Yorkers with a history of criminal system involvement. The first such protections were added in 1977 when the commission was given joint enforcement authority with the New York State Division of Human Rights over Correction Law Article 23A. Over the years, additional protections were added to the New York City Human Rights Law, most notably with the passage of the Fair Chance Act in 2015, which prohibits most employers, labor organizations, and employment agencies from inquiring about or considering a job applicant's criminal history until after a conditional offer of employment has been made and guarantees that job applicants receive proper notice and an opportunity to be heard before they may be rejected from a job based on an individualized assessment of their criminal history. Since 2015, the Commission has filed 486 complaints alleging employment discrimination based on criminal history, and as of last week, has 145 open matters related to employment discrimination based on criminal history. The Commission has conduct conducted a total of 1,261 tests related to Fair Chance Act, excuse me, related to the Fair Chance Act from fiscal year 2016 through to the present and filed a total of 100 Commission initiated complaints resulting from investigative testing. In fiscal year 2020, the Commission assessed approximately $800,000 in damages and civil penalties arising from claims of employment discrimination based on criminal history. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau has also been successful in obtaining far-reaching policy reforms that address employment discrimination based on criminal history in systemic ways with a focus on restorative justice remedies. For example, as the Commission testified in January, the Law Enforcement Bureau has settled cases in which respondents have, among other things, agreed to partner with reentry organizations to intentionally include people with criminal histories in the job applicant pool to incorporate New York City's ban the box policies in their job applications for offices nationwide and to voluntarily disregard certain categories of convictions that are not otherwise subject to such restrictions when assessing job applicants, including all convictions more than seven years old, marijuana convictions over two years old, convictions where the person participated in a diversion program and juvenile convictions. The Commission is also grateful for its close partnerships with many advocates and community groups that work with us to educate New Yorkers about their rights under the Fair Chance Act, including the Legal Aid Society, Legal Services NYC, the Legal Action Center, Vocal New York, the Community Services Society, the Fortune Society, and the Osborne Association, among others. Despite the absence of specific housing protections based on criminal history, in 2018, the Commission succeeded in resolving a case on behalf of New Yorkers who had been denied housing based on their criminal histories, utilizing a disparate impact theory of discrimination. The case was against PRC Management LLC, a housing management company that controls 100 buildings with 5,000 units citywide, and that had a policy of categorically denying housing to applicants with criminal histories. The Commission charged that this policy had a disparate impact based on race, color, and national origin, since Black and Latinx New Yorkers are disproportionately impacted by arrest, conviction, and incarceration rates citywide, and the applicants were not afforded an individualized assessment. The theory of this case was consistent with Fair Housing Act enforcement guidelines issued in 2016 by the United States Department for Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. Under the terms of the settlement, PRC management agreed to pay $55,000 in emotional distress damages to a victim who was impacted in the case and $25,000 in civil penalties. To revise its application and screening policies, train staff on its po new policies in the law, 
and invite applicants with criminal histories who were previously denied housing to reapply. The Commission strongly supports Intro 2047, which would provide the first ever housing protections for New Yorkers, specifically based on criminal system involvement. Because disparate impact claims, such as those in the case against PRC management, can be harder to investigate and prove than claims of direct discrimination, this addition to the law would significantly strengthen protections in this area. Intro 2047 would effectively prohibit discrimination against pro prospective tenants who have criminal records by making it an unlawful discriminatory practice under the New York City human rights law for a real estate broker, landlord, or their employee or agent to inquire about or take an adverse action based on a rental applicant's arrest or conviction history. Adverse actions would include denial of a rental application, higher application fees, failure to take action on an application, or the imposition of additional requirements or less favorable lease terms. The bill would also prohibit housing providers from directly or indirectly expressing a limitation based on a rental applicant's arrest or conviction history. For example, by stating in ads and application materials that they will not approve tenants with criminal records. The bill exempts from its coverage any action taken pursuant to a federal or state law or regulation that requires consideration of criminal history for housing purposes. It also would not apply to people renting at a room in their or their family's home or to people seeking a roommate. Importantly, the bill does not restrict housing providers' ability to pursue legal remedies if a tenant's conduct violates their lease terms. Intro 2047's simple, straightforward prohibition on inquiries and adverse actions based on criminal history provides clear guidance for housing providers, including smaller and less sophisticated actors, concerning their obligations under the law. New York City often leads the nation in introducing and implementing new legal protections strengthening human rights. In this area, it is time to amend our law to join the slate of other jurisdictions who have already passed these protections. These jurisdictions include Seattle, Berkeley, Oakland, the District of Columbia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Detroit, and Oregon, among many others. Intro 2047 would place New York City among those jurisdictions, including Seattle, Berkeley, and Oakland, with the strongest housing protections based on criminal history. Expanding the New York City human rights law to protect against housing discrimination based on criminal history would offer multiple potential benefits for the well being of our city. Such protections help to limit disparities in access to stable housing for protected classes of people who already face discrimination in housing and who are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. This includes Black and Latinx people, LGBTQI people, people with mental health disabilities, victims of sexual violence and increasingly women and mothers. By reducing the collateral consequences of criminal history in the housing context, this bill can help to alleviate problems of housing discrimination and segregation. Intro 2047 can also help to address rates of homelessness and the housing instability within the city. According to the Coalition for the Homeless, in 2018, at least 20% of adults who entered New York City shelters did so directly from a jail or prison. And research shows that jail and prison stays tend to increase the risk of homelessness. As we know, a stable home is the foundation for a person's well being, as well as the well being of their families and communities. A stable home enables people to find and maintain employment and promotes better health outcomes, since people with a stable home are better able to receive health treatments and to care for children and other dependents. Increasing access to housing also significantly reduces rates of child poverty and rates of recidivism. In short, we all stand to benefit when barriers are removed to stable, affordable housing for our fellow New Yorkers. While this bill will not on its own solve all of the challenges facing people with criminal history, we believe it is an essential step toward helping our city move toward a brighter future. For all of these reasons I've discussed, the Commission strongly supports Intro 2047, and we look forward to working on it with you. Thank you. Thank you to the members of the administration for your testimony. We're now going to move on to questions for the administration. I want to remind council members that should you have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you've raised your hands. We will now turn to our
co-chairs, Chair Levin and Chair Eugene for questions. Chair Levin, you may begin. I'm going to pass it over to Chair Eugene uh, for a moment because uh, I've got some childcare issues at the moment, but I will be um, listening and then I'll come back to my questions uh, after. All right, Chair Levin, we'll now pass it over to Chair, Chair Eugene for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Levin. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, take the opportunity also to thank all the participants, uh, the members of the community who came to testify and to share with us uh, their situation, the situation they are facing in the housing system. And I want to thank also all the members of the panel for the testimonies also. The, and one of the things that I want to mention is uh, Mr. Jordan was uh, talking uh, uh, about uh, the different programs and effort of the, of the administration to address the homelessness and also the discriminations. But based on what he said, it seemed that, that everything that is correct is okay, it's beautiful. But uh, Mr. Jordan, do you believe that the system is a well structured enough and and you have done everything possible to ensure that the people who have uh, vouchers who are in the housing system can have access to a uh, suitable housing and that can now fulfill their needs and also bring them some dignity as uh, members of our society So thank you, Chair Eugene, for your question. You're welcome. Given the tools that we have at hand, I think my testimony has demonstrated that we've made tremendous strides in servicing our clients. As I indicated, I mean, we moved out 150,000 individuals and or prevented them from going into shelter. The census are down to 54,000. Uh, evictions are down 41%. We work tirelessly, tirelessly with our Yes, we work tirelessly with our uh, with our providers, both shelter providers and also with our providers in the community, such as home based and legal service providers, to closely monitor any any pending eviction actions or any barriers to move outs, and we proactively work together to address them on a case by case basis as best we possibly can. Yeah. Hello. It seems there's a problem with the. Mr. Jordan, Hello? turn your okay. mute. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I would just also yes. add of course, there's always more work to do, as I did indicate in the testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, you know, I, I always mention uh, what my father usually said. He usually uh, told also uh, the children. And listen, guys, uh, there's no perfection in life. Whatever you are doing, how great you could be, how intelligent, brilliant you can be, but you will never reach perf perfection. There's always room for improvement. And he used to say that every time before you go to sleep, take a moment to think about what you have done during the day and what you would be doing tomorrow and see what you can do to implement what you have done. And uh, based on your experience, what do you believe that we as a city can do to make the housing system better based on your experience, based on everything that you have said in order to ensure that the people who are benefiting from the housing system who are vouchers, because what we have been saying throughout the city and also in the testimonies, it seems to, to, to indicate that we have to do a lot could you just elaborate, give us some examples, something that you believe that we should do to better the system? Any new approach, any way to rethink uh, the system that we have? I don't say that you, uh, we are not doing uh, you know, a, a lot, but as I said, there's no perfection and you do agree that much more needs to be done. Is there anything that you are thinking about or what you think that we can do as a city to do to the, uh, to the circumstance right now, to what we have, what we have right now, what could we do 
to implement and to, to better the system that we have. In addition to increasing the vultures and putting legislation and stuff like that. Is there anything that you believe that we, we, more we can do, we should do? Well, uh, thank you once again, uh, Chair Eugene. I think one of the things that we need to continue to do together is to work with our partners in both the state and the federal government to increase the housing supply. As you said, in addition to all the other things that we've been talking about and trying to do. But we're constantly at, at this administration evaluating what we can do. Thus, that's why we streamlined, right? In order to make the programs more easier and make it one and more, uh, more sellable and more understandable by both staff, clients, and landlords and brokers. So we're constantly evaluating, but we have to work within the means of what we have. But really, I mean, it's really a, a supply issue. Thank you very much for answer. You know, I always, when I'm thinking about uh, the city, when I'm thinking about our society, uh, our society, I believe that all of us, we are all members of the community. We are all members of the society. We are all human beings. Whenever there is an issue, I believe regardless of our position, our affiliation, our, 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 our socioeconomical uh, status, we should all come together to resolve the issues facing our society or facing our cities. I may be wrong, but that's what I believe on. And you, do, you did mention that many, some of the time you negotiate with uh, the landlord, with the brokers, because as I said, we are all in this together, all in this together. You know, I believe the best way to resolve any issues is to bring all the partners, everybody on the table. You mentioned that uh, you have had negotiations with the brokers. Could you elaborate on those negotiations? What happened? What did you discuss? What was the goal in the negotiation? And what was also the outcome? Did you reach the outcome? What you were trying to do by negotiating with the landlord or the brokers? So thank you once again, uh, Chair Eugene. I mean, it started with the beginning of the administration when we, re when we reintroduced and recreated these subsidies. We had to go on a vigorous campaign with RSA and the different broker and landlord organizations and, and, and basically try to let them know that this wouldn't be advantage all over again, that there were different programs. We tried to make them develop, uh, understand what the rules are. Over time, we tried to adjust based on the tools we had and add things we could. So we added a landlord bonus, we added a unit hole, we also added a basically a additional uh, security type mechanism that if a, a landlord was worried about maybe damaging the apartment or maybe not renting to someone because they felt the security voucher process didn't work for them or wasn't enough, they can not only get the security voucher returned to them, but they can get up to $3,000 additionally towards damages. So all of these things came about by this administration being willing to sit down and listen to everyone involved within the means that they had to see what we could do just by the city itself going it alone. But once again, like I said, I don't think we can by ourselves address the supply demand. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Assessment, um, I would like to ask you some few questions. I don't know if uh, my colleagues, uh, Council Member Levin, uh, is available or can I still, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the opportunity to ask some few questions. So let me ask uh, uh, some questions to Deputy Commissioner uh, 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 Assessment. You mentioned something that uh, I like you were talking about, as I said that previously, you heard that we are all in this together and we have to reach all the partners, regardless good or bad, but you know, everybody, everyone is a partner. And you mentioned commissioner, deputy commissioner uh, assessment that you educate the business owners. That's wonderful. You educate the people. We have to reinforce law, but one of the things that is very important, education also. It's very important. And I think that I had the, the opportunity to discuss that you know, in detail with the commissioner herself, because some of the time people can 
even the valid uh, rules and regulation and principle because of lack of information and education. And I appreciate it and the effort that the, the, the Human Rights Commission is doing in educating the business owners and also what I call the other partners. Can you elaborate on the type of, of, of uh, training of, uh, or education that uh, you have had the opportunity to, to, uh, to provide to the business owners in terms of uh, uh, housing, uh, discrimination of in housing and also, also in terms of uh, discrimination and other issues affecting the people that we are serving in New York City. Sure. Thank you for the question, um, Chair Eugene. We um, take training, outreach, and education incredibly seriously. It, it has been um, a key part of our ability to ensure that as many New Yorkers as possible both know what their rights are, but also know what their obligations are under the city human rights law. And as I mentioned, the law has changed dramatically over the past five or six years. Um, and so to keep up with those changes and ensure that um, people have the tools to comply. We've invested uh, greatly in building out workshops and trainings um, and building out our, our capacity to provide trainings in multiple languages across the city. Um, those often used to be held in person. They are all now virtual. Um, and you know, we will continue to explore the best way to deliver them. Um, we also require um, training when we are resolving cases. So in many circumstances where we have an, um, you know, an individual landlord or a broker who um, this is a, the first time that, they, that we learn that they are violating the city human rights law or they are unaware of the, the requirements under the city human rights law, they might be a small business, they don't have you know, an in-house attorney to advise them. We would often in those situations require training by us so we know exactly what content they are receiving. It is free um, and it is you know, something that we would offer monthly or quarterly so that they, they take the training, they change their policies, they ensure that um, you know, customers who are, who are coming to them get information about their rights. Um, and they are, they, we resolve those cases without a fine, without a penalty. Um, and we move on. Now, if we see those, those same respondents come back because we learn of other you know, additional violations, at that point, we would um, consider monetary um, fines or penalties against that respondent in addition to other potential <coughs> remedies. But we find that education and providing sort of an education first approach, especially with smaller operators, is really, really critical. Um, but we also think that when there are large operators with, you know, with housing stock in the thousands um, that are that are, have resources and and know or should know what the laws are, um, that we enforce the law aggressively to ensure that the message is being sent that violations of the city human rights law impacting large populations of New Yorkers, particularly vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, are, those violations are taken seriously and that there will be repercussions. So we have a really broad and, um, and uh, sort of varied approach depending on what the particular situation of that case um, and that potential respondent is. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that uh, my colleague, Council Member Alden, is raising the hand. Uh, operator, uh, moderator, can you please give the, the Council Member Alden the opportunity? Yeah, and I'd like to call, call on Council Member Holden for questions. Again, Council Members in general, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. And for any other Council Members who have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Over to Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairs, and uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, it's an important uh, hearing. Uh, I support the proposed legislation mentioned today, however, I do have some questions and concerns regarding intro 2047. Um, uh, for Senior Policy Council, Zoe Chenitz, um, my concern is specifically for folks registered as sex offenders, arsonists, and people with recent violent felonies, including drug dealers. Um, do you think that the bill might include either a time frame for applicants who have a recent history of violence or have demonstrated that they have been rehabilitated at all? 
Thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, if I can take a step back, uh, just to give a little bit of a frame, I think that might be useful. So as, as I mentioned uh, in my testimony, the Commission comes to this issue with quite a lot of experience um, in the employment sector. Um, and in that, in that context, um, our law takes an approach perhaps along the lines of what you may be contemplating. Um, there's, rather than a flat prohibition, uh, there's a procedural um, set of requirements for covered entities. So um, if someone is applying for a job, uh, they are first assessed based on their qualifications, but then given a conditional offer of employment. And it's only after that their criminal history is reviewed. Um, and it's generally with a focus on the relationship between someone's uh, criminal history and the specific job at issue. And then there's a three day hold period during which the person can uh, come back with uh, information that might be this, you have the wrong criminal history record for me or here's evidence of mitigation. Our view is this is not a useful framework in the housing context, it's a poor fit. Um, in part that's because in the employment context, an analysis that is specific to one job, say you're applying for a job as a driver, would be very different if you're applying for a job, uh, say, in, you know, in a, in a manufacturing plant. Um, the nature of the job would vary. In the housing context, the considerations um, for someone's criminal history are largely going to be the same we anticipate with respect to any unit someone would be applying for. And so that creates the risk of creating a group of people who may be unable to secure stable housing with all of the negative social outcomes that all the speakers today have highlighted. So with that view in mind, um, we do believe that a flat prohibition uh, offers important benefits, both for those who are seeking housing and also for the covered entities. Um, it's, it's straightforward and simple to understand, as Chair Eugene highlighted in his questions. Um, there are smaller uh, housing providers in the city um, who may be less sophisticated. This is a law that everyone can understand doesn't have any added expenses. It doesn't slow down the housing market in giving that assessment. And I'd also add, it related to your specific question, that there is already a very extensive body of state laws that dictate where people on the registry can live and that provide for an incredible amount of supervision for them. This law would do nothing to undermine that, but it would do uh, the, the good deed of ensuring that everyone in our city um, who, who's returning uh, has access to stable housing um, for themselves and for their families. And we believe that is to the net benefit of all New Yorkers. Um, but you mentioned uh, some other cities that already have this legislation. Um, I'm a little concerned because um, I looked at some of those cities and they, they have a little bit more specific language than we do, than we're proposing here. Um, you know, also Seattle's law, I believe their laws are encountering lawsuits and have not had a positive result on addressing discrimination. Do you know anything about, uh, have you looked into Seattle's problems now that they're, they're facing with a similar kind of law? Um, I, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar, or I'm somewhat familiar with the, the litigation that you referenced. So my understanding is that Seattle uh, um, passed a, a packet of legislation together, which included um, one, one legislative Piece that's that's simply not an issue here, which was a requirement that housing providers um, accept the first application that's that was qualified that they received in time. So that first in time requirement is not an issue here, and that was a significant portion of what um, the the plaintiffs in the litigation had challenged in Seattle. My understanding is that uh, there's been quite a, a number of different. Um, appeals that have already now gone up and been decided um, and the most recent decision was, was decided in Seattle's favor um, which was to to clarify what the standard of review would be for the fair chance housing um, proposal and, and the the uh, Washington State Supreme Court held that it's rational basis review um, so I think our expect our, our expectation Sorry. Uh, my time is up, so I just want to just mention that I think there are some consequences for other tenants that I think we have to consider. And I think there needs to be a language that, that the person should have demonstrated that they have been rehabilitated, that they're not 
let's say, lighting fires, they're not doing arson, they're not doing certain things that can jeopardize the other tenants. So I think this needs to be looked at a little bit more specifically, and we need to look at other cities that have, have, that have this kind of legislation, but they do have uh, more specific language. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Um, do I have time to respond briefly to that? Y you can wrap yeah, up. Yeah, sure. yeah, sure. I'll give you a um, yeah, I, yeah I, I just wanted to say we, we'd welcome the opportunity, of course, to discuss um, all of those uh, approaches and questions with you. Um, but I did want to clarify that um, this bill focuses on people's past and protecting against discrimination based on um, speculative speculation about um, future harm. It doesn't, it doesn't in any way limit um, landlords' ability to uh, obtain you know, legal remedies um, for actual conduct or for violations of lease terms. And we think that's a very important distinction to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other council members with their hands raised, I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Levin for questions. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kilowan. Uh, and I want to thank all of the, uh, oh, Chair Eugene. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Can you give me the opportunity to ask a very quick question? Of course. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, just to piggyback on what's uh, on the comment of uh, my colleague Alden, intro 2047 currently does not allow consideration of any type of criminal background for housing related papers. And uh, does a CCHR agree with this approach? But if not, what type of limitation should exist in this bill? Is there any language that should be changed? I know that you say that you would be uh, willing, uh, you know, happy to continue the conversation, but what is the position of uh, CCHR on this approach? And if uh, CCHR doesn't agree, what type of limitation limitation should exist in this bill. Commissioner? Hello? Hello? Hi, sorry, it was not letting me unmute did, briefly. Can you hear did me? Did you hear me? Did you yes, hear my question? Yes, I did, thank, thank you. you. Um, I can um, let my colleague um, Zoe Chanitz respond, but I, I will say that um, the commission supports the bill as it's brought, as it's proposed now there there are likely some changes that um, we can work through with um, with the committee um, and with city council um, and with our you know our administration partners. But the framework that's been proposed is the framework that the that the um, commission supports at this at this point. And Zoe, no. do you have anything to add? Please feel free. I don't have anything to add. That's what I would have said. Thank you. Now I want to turn it back to my colleagues and share living. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Eugene. Um, so uh, thank you thank you to the administration officials um, and to my co-chair. Um, and again, I apologize if you know, there's some squawking here from, from the little one. Um, uh, I would uh, like to ask uh, from HRA just about uh, some of the voucher uh, issues. Um, my first question is how many City FEPS shopping letters are currently out in the market. Can you hear so, me? Thank you for your Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. No. Okay, now I'm on ready. Go ahead, Aaron. You can start. Can you hear me? Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, the question was how many shopping letters um, are in the field. We'd have to get back to you on the exact number. I think what's important to note is that individuals um, 
might be eligible for more than one program, um, but we can get back to you with that exact number. I don't know if Bruce has anything to add. No, nothing to add, thank you. I mean, is that something that we keep track of? Is that a, is a number of, of, of shopping letters out there specifically for city pets? Cause that's what we're, you know, that's what we're talking about here. Is that something that we're, that we, <clears throat> that the city keeps track of? Sorry, I have a problem with the mute. Um, so what we're looking at is the fact that there are multiple solutions here. Um, and in regards to the number of shopping letters, um, we want to make sure that people are moving out. Um, and that could be through the multiple tools uh, that we have available to us on the rental assistance side uh, in the way of subsidized move outs as well as unsubsidized move outs. And then on the prevention side, we also want to be certain that for folks who are in community that we're making sure that we're connecting clients to the most uh, appropriate resource that might be paying rent or utility arrears. It might be the connection to the Office of Civil Justice and our anti eviction and anti harassment work. Um, or it might be referrals to home base to gain access to any number of preventative tools at the 26 locations across the city. Before, right. before all, I, under, that's all understood. I'm just, I just want to know because we're, we're because the city FEPS at the moment you can't get city FEPS as a prevent as a preventative voucher. You can only get it if you're in shelter, right? <laughs> No, uh, the city for HEPs voucher has the eligibility criteria posted online in which it can be used also as a prevention tool. It is primarily used as a move out tool. The vast majority of uses of city for HEPs is for move outs from shelter uh, into permanent housing. But there is a, a subset of the city for HEPs voucher that is used to maintain permanent housing um, in limited circumstances for individuals who are in community. Um, part of the issue with the shopping letter is the, the way in which that shopping letter um, is generated from either providers, from HRA, and from DHS. Um, but it is City FEPS primarily a move out tool. It complements the state FEPS program and can also be used, as I mentioned, in limited circumstances for uh, preserving uh, a tenancy in the community. Okay, I, I get all that. I, I actually just really want to know, I'm really genuinely interested here. Does the city keep track of how many are out there at any given time? Um, members of the administration, to avoid any of the technical difficulties that we've been experiencing with the muting and unmuting, if you can all remain unmuted during this question and answer, answer period, that will, that will um, mitigate for the technical difficulties we've been experiencing. So please remain unmuted at this time, all, all of the members of the administration. Part of the challenge was with a with a concrete number is the ways that that shopping letter is generated. Um, so to have a, a, a confirmed number is a challenge because of the ways in which that number can be that voucher can be issued. Okay. Um, does is there a, is what's the average length of time that somebody has a shop that a, a client has a shopping letter? So shopping before letters they, before they find an apartment. Shopping letters are renew can be renewed annually, um, and the time from the issuance to move to apartment um, is reliant on a number of factors. Um, I don't have an average number for you today. Um, it includes anything from uh, finding the correct size apartment, finding an apartment that meets the needs of the client as it relates to perhaps a borough preference, um, clients can reject an apartment just like you or I can. It might not meet their specific needs. Um, so there's a number of factors at play uh, in having the shopping letter and then move out. Well, how do we, what is our methodology for assessing whether the city FEPS program is successful or not? So last year alone, the city for HEPs program moved over 12,000 uh, individuals and were able to utilize that program. Um, that's significant number as we have all of our rental assistance tools. Um, but the voucher itself isn't the only tool, right? I, we have I, I, the NYCHA set-asides, um, we have legal services, 
and we have the payment of rent and utility arrears. Understood. I, I'm, I'm really just because the we're just really talking about city FEPS here. I, I understand that it's a tool in the toolbox. So let's let's kind of um, establish that 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 is a tool in the toolbox. There are other tools in the toolbox. It's not the only thing. And I just I'm but I you know for a few years now I've been trying to drill down on this particular program because this particular program is uh, in, is is really has an outsized role in that toolbox. And the evidence of that is when we look at the data from 2011 to 2014, when there was not a rental assistance program run by the city. And that's when we saw a probably 30% increase or 40% increase in the shelter census. So in terms um, of so so I just so I just so let's let's just because I know that sure. you, you so, mentioned that a few times. So I just want to make sure that like all of my questions are going to be about city FAPS. Okay. So I'm happy to talk uh, city FAPS, the, how do we what is our what is the methodology that we use sure. to determine whether it's meeting its objectives. Great. So you mentioned I think an important factor here, which is the uh, pretty significant increase we saw in homelessness when Advantage was not in existence. Um, mm -hmm. We saw a 38% increase in the years that we did not have that tool available to us. Um, sure. City for HEPs is something that uh, we streamlined in 2018. Um, prior to that, it existed as seven unique programs. The streamlining uh, that occurred in 2018 made that program easy to use for easier to use for clients, easier to understand and accept for landlords. That work is important. When you look at our census, if you want to talk about um, how we are measuring it, our census yeah. has been flat year over year from 2017, 18, and 19, which has not occurred for over a decade. Furthermore, our families with children census is at 2012 levels. So this program is well. Right now, it's at 2012 levels, but that's because of an eviction moratorium. That's not. I mean, it, 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 it is. It, it, it was, it was at in February. It was not at in February. It was not at 2012 levels. It is today. Wow. We've had an eviction moratorium in place now for six months. I just, I, I just, I, I, I get all the history. I think that we're. I don't want to. I don't really want to kind of go around in circles here. I'm just really trying to get at. You know, this is a governmental program. It's a it's a linchpin to our to our uh, homelessness efforts. I just want to know what the I mean, other than kind of these broad issues of you know whether our shelter census is remaining constant or like what is how are we determining how are we measuring the success of this actual program? Is this program working? Because 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 I'm because and, and the reason I ask is that we've been hearing from clients. I've been hearing from clients for years now, years years we had a we had this exact hearing an oversight hearing on the on on maybe the prior iteration of the vouchers i don't know it was like a couple of years ago now we had a hearing already about this we know we know anecdotally the challenges here i just want to know what what rigor the agency uses to to assess whether it's working or not because how are we to know I mean, we've had, we've had, how many iterations have we had? We've had Link. We had Link one through Gazillion. No more Link, Link's out. Now it's City, then it was City FEPS, now it's City FEPS. And we've had so many iterations. And how are we, how are we gauging whether these are successful or not? That's what I want to know. What are, what metrics are we using? What are the metrics? That's what I'm trying to get at. So part of the metrics include, do landlords accept the program? We've worked very closely with landlords um, to have them understand the program, to provide incentives to them, including a landlord bonus. As my colleague, Mr. Jordan mentioned, we talked about the unit hold bonus. Um, working with landlords is critical. We need to have that supply available to us to ensure that our clients can utilize the voucher and move into locations. We also wanna be mindful of the fact that while the program is uh, 
folks to be eligible for the program for five years and has the good cause extension for future years, we also want to be mindful to make this something that clients ultimately are able to pay their rent on their own. Um, so we're balancing both the incentives that we have for the landlords to have them use and accept the program and then the future ability to pay with our clients. Commissioner, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I'm, I apologize. I'm just, those are all um, kind of considerations, maybe qualitative considerations um, for, for the program, but, but they're, not, they're not metrics. What I'm, what I'm looking for are, are metrics, percentage of, 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 vouch, of, of shopping letters that are out there that are taken, that are accepted within, you know, that, that resulted in an apartment in, in three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. You know, I'm looking for, for I'm looking for data. I'm not looking. I'm I'm looking more. I understand that it's a, a so much, it's an art as much as it is a science, but but for years now I've been asking for numbers and I and I still don't have them. And so what I'd like to know are what are what are the what are the data here? I mean, frankly, I sent a letter I think to Commissioner Banks back in November of 2019, and I don't know if I ever received a response to that asking all of these questions. I, I don't know, I don't know what the data is. So I don't know. I mean, all I know is anecdotally people tell me they've had vouchers for years, two, three years, four years, and, and haven't been able to find an apartment. And that seems logical to me because the vouchers are worth what they're worth and they're not the fair market rent. So that there's a, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know if it's much more complicated than that, but I have no data. I have no data from the administration and I've, I've asked for it a number of times. So that's, that's what I'm kind of getting at here is I, where's the data? I need the data. Sure. So, I mean, we provide regularized reporting to council finance with each budget plan on the rental assistance program and our move out numbers. Um, as it relates to some of the metrics that you're talking about, I do think that it is more nuanced. We have clients who have preference just as much as, um, as you or I in terms of what they want to do in terms of finding an apartment. Um, and so clients can reject apartments um, just as quickly as they can. How many have rejected apartments? I can speak to the number of clients that I've worked with in my office, and there are instances in which clients reject apartments, and it can be for any number of reasons. Do we keep track be, of that. Do we keep track of be, whether they're rejecting apartments. Like, like, is there a is there a is there a number of clients that have rejected apartments? I would have to speak to my colleagues in terms of what numbers we have on that. You understand my frustration? I've been asking now. I mean, honestly, we talk. I mean, you and I have talked about this letter I sent back in November of last year. I never got a response. I mean, granted, COVID intervened there, but I sent the letter in November, asking all these questions, and never really got a response. Um, we can certainly follow up on the letter. Um, I think, as you rightfully noticed, it possibly was caught up in the COVID response. Um, but I would be to look at that letter. COVID started in March, and I sent the letter in November. Um, I so I mean, but, but this is. This has been ongoing. This is the reason that you may be sensing some frustration in my voice here is that we've been at this for years. And frankly, I mean, the administration has been supportive of home stability support, HSS, as the bill in Albany. And this legislation does much the same as HSS, it's just that the city is gonna have to pay for it instead of the state. And so if we're if we're if we're really if the city's objection to this is really that we don't want to pay for it. We think the state should pay for it. Then, then that's an argument that I will accept at face value. But, and, but and we've I noted that. I mean, we've 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 pointed to the places where we've had the most success in driving down homelessness. We've talked about the work that was done collaboratively with the federal government um, as it related to uh, focus on veterans homelessness. Having the additional resources from the federal and state government. Um, is is critical and it's even more critical now when we're operating in a world in which we're facing very significant budget uh, declines we're facing layoffs um, at the city that not only will impact staff but potentially programs because of the very real budget situation that we're currently facing um, I know we've talked and I've talked to your staff about support of long-term borrowing. These are all real situations that we need to face. And I think having 
um, a program where now we would increase the city's obligation uh, is problematic. There's also the, the very real problem of setting up a situation in which the state program would be uh, less attractive to landlords and they would be able to hold out and you know only accept a city for HEPs voucher. That is, that is troubling and we don't want that. We wanna make sure we have as many tools and I know you only wanna talk about city for HEPs today and that's fine, but that's there's, not a, there's not a single tool um, that works for everybody. And that's why we have the multifaceted approach. It's why for some people it's gonna be supportive housing, for others it's going to be a roommate. Uh, we need to be able to match the variety of solutions that we have available to us for each client. Okay, so then, because I've been asking for data and numbers and, and they're not forthcoming, what would the administration say to somebody or a family, an individual or a family, who has had a city for HEPs voucher for 36 months and can't find an apartment? What would, be, what would the administration say to that? That we stand ready to continue to work with them, that we want to use the resources that we have available through our housing specialists, through our team at DHS, through our teams they're at the They're not to working. Find... Three years with a voucher is not, is not an acceptable outcome. I mean, it's just not a, it's not a successful outcome. That's, that's, that means that we've been paying whatever we pay a month, what, $3,000 a month for somebody to stay in shelter? We've been paying all of those months. We pay for that, those, that's all those months longer. I mean, one other way to look at this, we see how many fewer people are in shelter right now because of the eviction moratorium. How much are we saving by those families not in shelter? And, and if we were to look at that and say, how much would it have cost us if there was no eviction moratorium to keep those families from being evicted? Mr. Nash is holding up a calculator. I can't see the numbers, but He's probably giving me some good, how much would we, how much would we have saved if you just took the number of families, the difference between the number of families that would have been in shelter, and we know that they're, they're not in shelter because of the eviction moratorium, that's that difference between 60,000 and, or 59,000 and 54,000. And so those number of families, how much, if we had, if we, if we were to have a city for HEPs, since it's, since it's available to people in communities to keep them in their apartments, how much is the difference between what we would have paid to keep them in their apartments versus what we would have paid to keep them in shelter? And it, I guarantee you, it is more than $1,000 a family a month. That difference. I just, I, the argument that it's not fiscally sound, even at this time, to, to increase the city's obligation, we're obligated. We have a right to shelter. We're already obligated. We already pay for it. We just pay for it in terms of shelter and saying paying for it to keep people in their apartments or get somebody in an apartment. I mean, it's, it, it, my frustration here is that we've been having this conversation for years now, years, and we've held off we held off in March to see if the state was going to act. And I guess the argument can be made that we'll just hold off again until March 2021 to see if the state wants to take this up again, whether the governor has any interest in taking this up again. But at a certain point, I'm out of the council and Mayor de Blasio is out of the mayoralty. And at the end of 2021, are we going to look back and say, gee whiz, we really should have just, uh, you know, waited longer. Okay. You know, I mean, we, we, we will, at a certain point, the opportunity will be passed. And this is, because there are people that are in shelter for years because the, these vouchers don't work. We don't have Section 8 vouchers. There's no Section 8 vouchers available. I mean, there's like a handful of Section 8 vouchers. If you get a Section 8 voucher, it's like winning the lottery. It's like winning the lottery. And guess what? Shelter, shelter, Section 8 vouchers work. Somebody gets a Section 8 voucher, they're staying in their apartments. They're uh, finding new apartments. I mean, honestly, I don't quite understand why we just don't make a section, a city funded Section 8 voucher that has all of the obligations of Section 8 voucher to the point where a prospective landlord doesn't know the difference. There, it's just a Section 8 voucher. You know, the landlord will say, what, what does it matter to the landlord whether it's federally funded or not or city funded? 
If it's the same voucher, a landlord will take it because we know a landlord will take Section 8 vouchers, except for those that engage in source of income discrimination. But we know by and large, you present a city pass voucher and a Section 8 voucher to a landlord, we know which one they'll take. We all know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you have any response to that, but I mean, really, I, without data from the administration, all we have, all we have is the evidence in front of our faces and like what we can see with our own eyes. And, but the fact that we don't even know how many vouchers are, I mean, how many shopping letters are out there at any given time. We don't know what the average length of time that somebody uh, uh, is, is, is shopping for an apartment. All this is anecdotal because we have no data from the administration. So I, I, I don't know what to say other than, you know, I, we have to act and we have a super majority of sponsors on this legislation and I'm not waiting any longer. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues if they have any other questions. No other, no other questions from council members. Yes. Council members have their hands raised. I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. If Chair Eugene would like to, like to ask a question at this yes, point. Yes, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, to the commissioner, to the deputy, uh, deputy commissioner, we know that there have been a citywide budget cut, and I believe that uh, CCHR has been uh, uh, affected by that also. Could you uh, speak in, in detail? Can you tell us uh, how the CCHR uh, is going to be impacted, uh, you know, especially in the housing discrimination enforcement in particular? How the CCHR is going to be again, impacted by this uh, citywide budget cuts? Um, thank you for the question, Chair Eugene. Um, like all city agencies, we're grappling with um, you know an unprecedented uh, budgetary crisis. Um, we are currently you know working within the current constraints that we have. Um, we continue to do the work. Um, our work has, has been impacted by both going to telework um, over a single weekend. We moved our entire workforce to telework um, and, um, and continue to, to do most of our work remotely. Um, and we are challenged as we've been challenged before with a, a incredibly um, broad mandate under the, you know, the, one of the broadest anti-discrimination laws in the country. Um, to, to do this work effectively um, and systemic and to address systemic problems um, within our current resources. And so it's not a new challenge for us. Um, it's been, uh, we were um, uh, an agency of about 55 staff when the commissioner started in 2015. We are larger than that now. Um, we are not at our largest, um, but, um, but we have greatly appreciated the support of the council and the administration in um, growing our agency from, from when we started five and a half years ago. Um, but we continue to um, move within the current constraints and, um, and get as creative as we can to, to remain as effective as possible. Yeah, uh, during the uh, years, uh, for years, during the, uh, the public hearing that we have had, uh, with uh, uh, the, the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, we have been trying to ask uh, you know, the Commissioner of uh, CCHR and about the budget constraint, you know, the challenges that they are facing in terms of, uh, 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 you know, of enforcing the law and also uh, of providing the services to the people in need. But they never give us a clear, you know, uh, response about the needs that they are facing in terms of the financial needs. But let, let, let me say that like, we know that uh, the, the New York State Division of Human Rights is currently enrolled in the Fair Housing Assistance Program and receive funding from HUD. Why does our CCHR try to, uh, uh, doesn't try to enroll also in this program? Um, this is something that I know we've discussed before. Um, it is my understanding, uh, based on conversations that I've had with our Deputy Commissioner for Law Enforcement, Sapna Raj, um, who has testified before this committee before, 
um, that the HUD uh, administrative requirements and reporting requirements would require um, one nearly or entirely um, the staff time of one staff member. And we do not have the staff to spare at this point. I'm sorry, could, could, could you repeat that for me? Would require it, what? It is my understanding that to comply with all of the reporting requirements that the um, that this program administered through HUD um, requires would eat up one staff member's entire portfolio. And so that would that would reduce our law enforcement staff or support staff by one effectively. And so the assessment was made by our deputy commissioner that at this stage, we cannot afford to lose uh, additional staff member time to comply with those administrative um, requirements. Um, we can reassess that at a, at a later stage, but because we are a file as of right agency, essentially, if you state a claim of discrimination under the city human rights law, we cannot turn you away. Um, our doors remain virtually open. Um, you know, we, we are trying to be as effective as we can with our current resources. And so to commit that kind of level of staff time to that the administrative requirements for the HUD program just does not um, make sense for us right now. Yeah, but I, uh, I really don't understand that because if you did apply, you would probably receive more funding, more resources, and you would be able to hire some additional you know, staff to fulfill this requirement, I believe. That would be beneficial also. Uh, you know, uh, to the people that we are serving, because a lack of resources, you know, is a big uh, uh, challenge. You know, for many institutions, when you have enough uh, resources, enough uh, you know opportunities, so that means you can do much more. You can provide much more services to your constituents. So don't you think that it would be beneficial to New York City and to the people that we are serving to apply to this program and get more money, more resources to hire? Uh, additional staff, you know, uh, to comply onto the, uh, with this uh, requirement. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. It doesn't allow me to unmute myself. Um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we make, we are, we are working and crunching the numbers like every other city agency to um, expand, mm -hmm. um, to expand our work to ensure that we are using our resources as effectively as we can. Um, I think that there are questions as to how quickly, um, you know, how quickly the, the resources from HUD would, would um, impact the agency. Um, and again, our staff have dockets of, you know, 30 to 70 cases each. And if we are pulling staff members away to handle some of those administrative requirements, um, we would, th those cases would then not be assigned to an attorney or would be assigned to other attorneys. So again, I don't have more detail I can share right now. Um, we're happy to get back to you on this, but I've had this conversation with our deputy commissioner for law enforcement, who um, her, her expertise is, she's former, formerly from um, the Department of Justice, her expertise is in housing discrimination. She's very familiar with the HUD program. I can get back to you further on this later, but again, my um, just checking in with her this morning about this and her assessment was that um, this program did not make sense for us right now. Yeah, but it, it seemed to me that the issue is an issue of uh, resources to hire more people because you cannot afford to lose one staff member because more resources, if you had the, the funding or the resources from art, you would probably be in better position to hire more staff, I believe. But let me ask one thing. When uh, did the CHR last apply for this funding? Um, I just, if, you... if, I, if I could just clarify something I think is important. Um, the money, it, there's a lot of strings attached to that HUD money. And from what I understand, it will not be allowed to be applied to personnel. So it would, and because it varies, you know, quarter to quarter, we could not guarantee that we could fulfill, you know, a, a lot, that wouldn't be a guaranteed particular sum. And from what, and again, from what I understand, we couldn't actually apply it to personnel lines. 
So it, we wouldn't, right. it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that sort of, um, you know, easy answer of if we did A, we would get B, we would not be able to add personnel based on that HUD money. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me turn it back over to Chair Levine. Thank you, Chair Eugene. Um, thank so, you so much. Um, I, I, you know what, I, I'm going to ask a couple of um, uh, more technical questions on, on the rental assistance vouchers. Um, with, when using City Fahebs vouchers, who is currently tasked with completing inspections of apartments prior to move-in? And has this, has this changed recently? I'm going to start and then turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Jordan. So um, we conduct inspections. Um, those happen at the provider level. Uh, the apartment review checklist and guidance is posted online. Uh, so landlords have an opportunity to review that. We have a whole section of information for landlords available about the program online. And I can turn it over to Bruce to go through some additional information about that apartment checklist. Yes, so thank you, Councilman Levin. Um, for apartments, out of, for apartments out of shelter, DHS, I mean, the shelter providers do those inspections. For apartments in the community, uh, the CBOs like Homebase do that. And for any rooms, uh, there's a special unit within DHS that does those. Completes those, excuse me. And, and what's the, um, the program again that, that moves people out of state? The uh, Special One-Time Assistance Program, SOTA. SOTA. Who does the um, who does the uh, the inspections for soda? So I I, I don't want to misspeak on the record. Um, that program did change earlier, I believe earlier this year. Um, so I want to be mindful about my my testimony on the record. I will get back to you. There are inspections though for those those moveouts. Okay. Um, okay, but but we. Who, who do, we, you'll tell me later who does them? I'm going to get back to you. I don't want to misspeak on the record. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you provide us for the past year, can you provide us the number of annual placements by population? So families with children, adult families, single adults by gender and average median maximum and minimum length of stay in the shelter system until placement into permanent housing with a voucher? I don't have that data readily available today. Um, when can, can we expect um, that data? Um, if, as we'd normally do after hearings, if the committee can follow up with the data requests, we will move to answer those as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, one complaint that we've heard around city FAPs is um, <clears throat> landlords complain about about uh, payment issues. Um, what what has HR what is does DHRA take any actions to ensure that rental system payments are made on time, made on or before the scheduled payment date? And and, and what is the what's the the process and has that process been amended in any way in recent years? I'm gonna refer to my colleague, Mr. Jordan. So thank you, uh, Chair Levin. Um, provided that, of course, we have the correct information from the landlord, provided also that if the landlord's not conflating missed payments that a client might've had to pay or didn't pay from their share, we had had some problems in the past when we first started the program because it was going through payments were going through the state's WMS system, but we're in a process now, as we mentioned earlier, we have RFP out with different things, but we have a process where we're doing a landlord management system. That'll be a better porthole hole for landlords to actually put in their own information in real time. Uh, there'll be less touches across DSS, HRA and, 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 uh, and DHS, which sometimes in the past could create a problem with different, uh, different entities working with a client all on their housing. There'll be just one entity touching the golden record so that uh, payments will go to the correct place. And we have various vehicles through both 
Once again, our legal providers, our home-based providers, we do have hotlines where clients and landlords can call and let us know there's an issue and we'll address it ASAP. Um, <clears throat> how much does the city perhaps voucher pay compared to fair market rent right now? What's the, what's the percentage? Sorry, I'm pulling up my. Bruce, if you have it ready and available, I just had closed the document, sorry. So, Chair Levin, uh, an example would be three people would be 1580, which could possibly get you a two bedroom apartment versus the section eight NYCHA FMR levels for 2020 would be 2669. So the difference there being about $900 a month? Somewhere around there, yes. Um, do you have examples of, of other unit size or, or household composition? Excuse me, excuse me. Let, let me, let me just clarify. A, a, a two bedroom would be 2107 FMR level, but okay. our household size would be 1580. So, so it's a little less, excuse me. $500. Around 500, about 500, yes. 500 less. Um, I, I guess it's just a, don't. Don't you guys think that 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 would open up a lot more apartments to be available to people if we could get up to that FMR? Council member, as we stated previously, the concern has to do with additional resources, um, getting additional funding, additional resources from the federal government, from the state government. You've mentioned that we've been supportive of the home stability support program. That is in fact true. And while that would do what you're seeking here for this program, it would do it across the board and we wouldn't lose the valuable resource uh, that a state perhaps that individuals move out of shelter each year utilizing. Why not do both? Why not do that this year and still fight for, for uh, HSS on the state level? But in the meantime, saying we're not gonna wait anymore. I completely appreciate the sentiment. As I said earlier, the city is very much focused on the ability to have the authority to utilize long-term borrowing. Without getting additional resources from the state, we are currently facing not only layoffs, but program cuts um, that are gonna have further devastating impacts. Uh, we need to focus our attention on getting that authority and ad again, getting additional resources from the federal government, whether it be in state and uh, local aid and or additional resources from the state. Okay. Um, okay. I, I appreciate very much uh, the testimony of, of uh, every member of the administration that's here. And um, I look forward to working expeditiously on these pieces of legislation and moving forward. Thank you. And just for a note, we, we do have um, staff who are staying uh, to watch this. I need to jump to prepare, prepare for another hearing. This week. Thank you. Thank you to the members of the administration for your testimony and for answering council member questions. Once more, I want to remind everyone that we are going to be moving on now to additional public testimony. I'll be calling individuals to testify in panels and also calling your name one by one as you're up to testify. Uh, again, for council members who are on our hearing right now, if you have questions for a particular panelist, use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll be called on after the entire panel has completed their testimony. Again, public testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you begin to deliver your testimony. And our next panel is going to be Christine Quinn, Basha Gerhards, Sarah Wilson, and Devon Nash. We will now begin with Christine Quinn. Time starts now. Thank you very much. And I just want to uh, start off by saying uh, thank you to Chair Levin and thank you to Chair 
Dr. Eugene for having this hearing. Well, let me say, go Steve, go. You were asking all the right questions. They were uh, dodging every answer. And I think the real question to, okay, the state might be more than the cities then, but we need to leave. New York has a history of doing more than the state, doing more than other people, and then the others follow suit. Look at the smoking bill as just one example. So the question here is, do we want to humanely lead? The council is saying yes, the mayor is saying, saying no. Uh, let me just go to my uh, uh, testimony. Uh, I'm Christine Quinn, the president and CEO of WIN, the largest provider of shelter and services to families with children in New York City. I'm here today to support all of the legislation on the agenda, but in particular to urge the passage of Intro 146, which would peg the city's rental voucher values to the fair market rent. The City for HEPs voucher is intended to offer a clear, straightforward exit plan out of shelter for eligible families. But because the voucher amount is so low, that exit path is closed. Last year, all of all women families who had access to City for HEPs vouchers, only 28% left shelter using one. Only 28%. To put that in, in stark comparison, 32% of the families left for placements that were not stable, that were high risk to return to shelter. And these struggles have not abated no matter what you hear about dropping rents since COVID-19 struck. <clears throat> the problem is that City perhaps pays far below market value, even in the most affordable parts of the city. The city perhaps maximum rent allowed to three or four persons is 1,580 per month. According to Street Easy data, there is no neighborhood, not one, in the city where the median asking rent for a two-bedroom apartment is this low. In order to make City for Heps an effective tool, it rents, its rents must reflect the actual cost of housing in New York City. City for Heps maximum rent amounts should be tied to New York City's fair market rents, or FMR. The FMR is used to set red rents for HUD subsidy programs, including Section 8, which the chair spoke of. In FY21, FMR for a two-bedroom apartment in New York City is $2,053 a month. This would increase the maximum rent allowed by $473. Those are different numbers than the one we heard from the representative of the city. He I gave, uh, gave the NYCHA number, which is a little higher, FYI. Uh, this would increase the amount allowed by $473 a month. This would significantly broaden access to many neighborhoods for voucher holders in the last five months, instead of there being one neighborhood with affordable rents. I will submit my rest for the uh, rest of the testimony for the record, but I just want to say, when you give somebody a, a city for HEPs voucher, you're giving them hope. You're sending them a message that they've worked hard and they now have a vehicle to get out of shelter. But when you give them a city for HEPs voucher that can't rent one apartment in one neighborhood, you're giving them false hope. And that is just cruel. And I'm so thrilled that Chair Levin and Chair Eugene and the, vast, and the sponsors of the bill, which I believe is up into the 40s, are gonna end that cruel practice of false hope and get vouchers in fam homeless families' hands that can actually help move mothers and children out of shelter. The best way to prevent a homeless child from get, growing up to be a homeless adult is to get them out of shelter. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much to our former speaker, Christine Quinn. We'll now call on Sarah Wilson. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Sarah Wilson. Um, I'm here with Safety Net Project, um, and I'm here to speak in favor of Intro 146 regarding increasing the amount of the city sets voucher to be the fair market rate. Um, I'm happy to be here, but I'm also upset to be speaking. Um, the fact that I was here over three years ago, specific date, June 27, 17, 
as the uh, other council mentioned, um, to speak on this exact same issue as over three years later, and there have been unfortunately many deaths, many um, horrible things that have happened over that time period that couldn't have been avoided, especially prior to COVID. Um, with that said, um, sorry, issues like um, what goes on on the Upper West Side. Problem is that you put 300 people into three separate addresses. It's not the problem, it's not the people that you're putting places, it's the policies that are putting them there. Um, it's overpopulated and it's people with very minimal resources. Anyway, this is all linked in and relevant because with your vouchers standing the way that they are not being a fair market value, not only have you created this, but you're forcing them to live in it because they can't get out. The dollar amount, as was stated before, should be something similar to what goes on with the uh, Section 8 vouchers. Um, bear with me. Um, the fact that it would be 30% or a third of the income. The fact that, um, sorry. Um, Okay, going further, I'm also speaking on the fact that I did have a voucher in 2017 and that I was not, um, I had extreme difficulty trying to obtain it as well as use it. When I was able to obtain it because the shelter did not help me, I'll keep in there that I spent 744 days in shelter on a voucher that took 72 hours. Um, I was able to obtain it, but no one wanted to accept it. So I started going and looking at apartments, not telling them I had a voucher, being shown it, and then being declined because um, uh, source of income discrimination. People said we did not want a non-working tenant. We wanted things of that nature. Um, but in hindsight, I didn't put my efforts into pursuing that because I put it into housing. I'll close up with saying this, because there's a lot that I wanted to say. But when you're looking at someone and um, it hurts your eyes, it's because you're supposed to help them, not remove them from the line of sight. And you're hustling and shuffling people around working on shelters when you need to be working on housing vouchers. It's like monopoly money. It's just not the right dollar value. They can't ever get out. The only way to change a homeless person situation is to house them. Period. Point blank. Thank you for letting me speak. Time's expired. Thank you so much, Sarah. And we will now have Devon Nash. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Devon Nash. Um, I'm currently at North Star Residence uh, Shelter with my nephew. Uh, we started out um, when he was 18 in the shelter and we're still here. It's uh, now 33 months later. I have a few, I, I'm gonna change my testimony today only because uh, there was some numbers that was you guys were looking for. Well, um, the, the government pays for me to be here and my nephew $3,343.41 every month. Um, the FEPS voucher is $1,325. Now you guys are gonna pay, give me money for rent, $1,325, but you're giving these guys $3,334.41 at 33 months, that comes out to be roughly $110,035.53. That's just on the housing and feeding us. The other services, which I got zero because I've been in the system for 33 months and I'm still here. So this system that you guys spent $93,535.53 on could have actually, the combined total with 110,000 plus 93,000, you guys could have bought a house in 33 months. You could have bought me a condo, a two, two three bedroom condo for 200, um, 200 and, uh, $203,571. That makes absolutely no sense. And it's over, and, and my building alone, it's 15 families on every floor times 11. So that's 165 families at $3,334 per month with an additional, what is the total? Because I had to, we have to go get our breakdown. And they pay per month $6,000. $169.02 every month, every month for us to stay in the shelter to no, to with no end in sight. But you're going to get, and then let's say we do get an apartment. You say, okay, we'll give you $1,325 to live comfortably. 
or find to help you do with that. But you're paying these people all of this money. This is an atrocity. This is a waste of money. You could have gave me $2,500 a month to live comfortably in a two-bedroom apartment and saved $4,062 um, $4, every month if you just gave me $2,500 for an apartment, a decent apartment. I can find an apartment for $2,500, a two-bedroom apartment for me and my nephew, who happens to have special needs. So now you stick us in a place with no, with no, I had to get out, I had to go out on my own. And I found an agency called Cases that actually helped me. I've been asking since the day I walked in the system, I said, my nephew has psychological problems. He needs help. From day one, everywhere I went, every agency I went to, I told that to. You know what I got help? January, when I decided to call up all of these other resources that I, because I'm a psychology major, and I was able to, and I did my clinium, and so I was doing these actual services, and so I decided to reach out to these people. There's no communications with the city and state, none of the agencies. You guys sit up there, and you talk, and you, you, you smile, and you say all of these nice things, but it's just window dressing. It's fancy window dressing, and it's very expensive dressing, window dressing, that, to, to be exact, with no services. So you have a window that's worth $203,571.06, and it's broken. And, but you keep on pouring money into it. I, I, can someone please explain that to me? Why are you willing to give them $6,000, over $6,100 a month, but you will not give me $2,500 for rent? That's the question I would like to ask. And I'm here. I'm here in the system. So this is, can be verified. So you guys have to know what the city is paying out every month. So you guys sit up there and act like you don't know and you're pulling these figures out. That woman was right. There is no end in sight in here. And how many people that go out, how many people come back? That's what you need to know. That's what you should be asking because your system is not working. They told me that I have to have, if I have a two-year lease, I have to have the difference. And so the difference is $725 a month. So for one year, I got to have $8,200 in the bank just to move in that apartment. If I want a two-year lease, I got to have $16,400. Where am I going to get that kind of money from? Where am I going to get that kind of money from to live in the, under the FEPS program that you guys created? Where am I going to get that from? Somebody please answer. Anybody, anybody can take it. Anybody can, add, can verify my figures because this is, what the, this is what I go down to get. This is my breakdown. This is my breakdown right here. This is my breakdown. So this is what the city is paying every month. So you have proof right here. And the numbers don't lie. I'm a numbers person. The numbers don't lie. I'm just asking for $2,500 out of 6,000. And you can save. You, if you gave everybody enough money to get an apartment, you can, yeah. you can wipe out this. Right. Sorry, but I'm, I'm really happy because I'm actually living through this. So yes, you can pay, it's a little bit you can personal. pay a mortgage with that $2,500. You, yeah, you most definitely can pay a mortgage. I know people who are not who pay less than $2,500 a month for a mortgage. I know people paying less than that. With 3% down, you could have gave me 3%. You could have bought me a house for this kind of money with no is And I'm still here. I'm still here. That means this is going to go on. It's going to keep going on. Until 2000, what do you say, 2021? That's when it's coming around again? So in 2021, I'll be here 45 months. And what will you guys have to say then? I'm a statistic. That this is not working. It's not working what you're doing there. It's not working. It's not. It's not at all. And this is just, this is me. Imagine all the other people who gave up. You should see the people around here. They're walking around with their heads down. People do not give you eye contact. They're sad. People are very stressed out around this time. This was before COVID. So just imagine how they're going through right now with COVID going on. Yeah. Well, you know, you should see the food. They give these people $125 a week to feed us. Rotten fruit, molded bread, spoiled milk. Give me $125. I can, I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. I'll make it work. I don't need it. I mean, my nephew, we live over $10 every day. I give him, me and I, we eat $5. We split our meals down $10 a day, $300 a month, every month. Every month because I don't eat this. You're paying for nothing. Most of that stuff going to garbage and they check off the day that we're eating it. We're not eating it. There's tons of it going in the garbage. Tons of it. So you're not feeding us. All that is a lie, what you're saying there. You can give me $125 a week, that's, that's $500 a month. But you give me $354 in food stamps? But you know this is what it's gonna cost for me to eat? Why are you doing this? Why, it's like you're making us suffer on purpose and you're throwing money. Where is this money going to? Who's it going to? It's a 
supposed to be for us, right? But we're not receiving anything. The counselors are overworked. My counselor has four floors, 15 families on each floor. You do the math. How is she supposed to help in every two weeks she got to put in paperwork? Must. So she's just, she's inundated with paperwork alone. Just to check, making sure that we're here every day. So where can she, where is, where is it time for her to say, let me help you get an apartment. Let me help you with some things that you got going on. Where's the time of that? We don't even have a job developer here. How are you supposed to get a job without, get an apartment without a job? Something so vital. What is wrong with you people? What is wrong? Thank you, Mr. Nash. No, it's I... not like you don't know that people need this stuff to survive. It's not like you don't know it. So you're purposely doing this, and why? Mr. Nash, you're, you're right. You're purposely doing it. You're right. I mean, I, we're not purposely doing it, but you're right. You're, you are right. You are right. Don't patronize me, please. Don't patronize me. Don't patronize me. I'm living in this. I've been living in this shelter for my nephew for three years. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. At, at $203,571.06. Don't do that. That's more than some people making a lifetime. Don't do that. Don't do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Nash. We're now gonna call on Basha Gerhards. Time starts now. Since we're having some technical difficulties we'll bring, with bringing on Basha Gerhard, so we're going to now turn to any questions that council members have for this panel. Um, turning to our chairs, if there are any questions at this point, and if any other council members on right now have questions, we just ask that you use the raise hand function, and I will call on accordingly. Council member, Chair Eugene, Chair Eugene. Uh, yes, I don't have a question, but I just have a very short comment. And uh, I want to thank the gentleman who came to testify with such emotion. And uh, uh, I want to thank him, you know, for his, uh, you know, uh, statement. But I want to, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And I just want him to know that we in the city country were up the hand on us. Can you hear me? Chair, I think you need to fix your microphone. Uh, we're having a hard time understanding. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me now? Uh, no. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but it's coming in very choppy, sir. Okay, let, let, let me do something. All right. Give me one second. Very quick, very quick. Yes, hello. Much better, hear? much better. Thank you very much, thank you. Yes, I was saying that, you know, I want to thank the gentleman who testified, and, uh, but I want uh, everybody to know that we in the city council, what we are doing, we are fighting on behalf of the people. We are trying to improve and to uh, do everything that we can do to serve our constituents, to serve the people who are in need of uh, affordable housing. This is uh, a human right issue. People have the right to to have access to uh, uh, dignified, affordable housing for themselves and, and for their children. And we will continue to do that. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention also, I'm very delighted to see, as a matter of fact, the picture of the former uh, speaker, Christine Queen. And I want to thank her for her participation to this very important uh, public hearing, you know, that addressed so many issues affecting the people that we are serving. I know that uh, she knows her stuff, and I commend her for the, for the way, for a passion or dedication to fight for the people who are, you know, seeking affordable housing in New York City. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Eugene. I really, really appreciate that. And I learned a lot working with you and working with Chair Levin. So I'm great to have the opportunity because of both of your leadership to have this conversation today and hopefully to have action very soon. So thank you. And thank you again. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, this panel um, uh, for your very valuable insight um, and for uh, making a very compelling and uh, data-driven case uh, for this legislation. And I just, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, Speaker Quinn, I do want to also offer my condolences on the loss of your thank father. You. Who, thank you very much. I'm yes. sorry, can I, can I extend my condolences also of course. to you? Of course. I didn't know that. I know your father, very nice person, wonderful person. And I see vividly, the, you know, every time that he came to the city yeah. council, and I, I think he's a veteran also. He was, he was. He was. Uh, thank you both very much. I haven't really thank you. announced it publicly, so to speak, but uh, he was a World War II veteran in the Navy. He uh, was part of the bombing of Wake Island and ex escorted the Missouri to the surrender. He got COVID in March and mm. uh, died from complications Sorry. of COVID. Thank you. Sorry. So, he was great up until the very end. He lived a classic, I would say, historic New York life. And he loved being at the council. And you two and so many others were so kind and generous to him. So thank you for that. I you will know, always remember it. You know, as a former chair of the uh, Veterans Committee, I got a great you know, respect for all the veterans. You know, and I admire all of them for their service. And thank you to you for your father's service to this nation. Thank, thank you. you. And God give Thank you the you. comfort that you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I want to thank uh, thank this entire panel, and um, and we're going to do our best at this council to to make this right. So, greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you to this entire panel, and now we are going to call up the members of our next panel, who are going to be in this order: Joseph Soto, Salik Karim, and Allison Wilkie. And we will begin with Joseph Soto. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, my name is Joseph Soto. Good afternoon, everybody. My condolences to Quinn and all of our families that's been affected by the COVID, including my own. Um, my story is basically the same as everybody else's. I'm just gonna be re reiterating um, what everybody else has already said, but through a different uh, perspective. Um, I came out of prison last October. I did 25 years. Um, I was in there since the age of 17. Um, and throughout my, I worked real hard, real hard to get out of my first parole. You know, I got out, when well, first time I went in front of parole, they seen how good I was, they let me go. They said, you're the perfect candidate to get out. And they let me go at, the, at level four. I didn't even have to work my way up to level four. That's how hard I worked. Three months after my release, I'm working in the health department as a peer specialist. That's my ID, right? Um, I'm, I'm, three months after that, I was ready to leave and get my own place. But when I, let me backtrack. When I got out of prison, I, I had to go straight to a shelter. And then the Fortune Society was fortunate enough to let me, I was fortunate enough to let them let me go and stay in their academy. However, while my stay there, I'm listening to everybody tell me their stories, many stories like Nash. Nash, I feel your pain. Um, I tried to go through a vouch, voucher program, but after six months out of prison, I still couldn't navigate that system. I said, you know what? Forget that. I'm not, I'm tired of, I'm not going to get stuck in this system for years. For 25 years, I dreamed about having my own place and being a productive member to society. I'm already a productive member of society working as a peer specialist. Now my only thing I need to do was to get my own place. And I did it on my own without the voucher, without no, no, no help from the city because I wasn't, I didn't want to get stuck in that system. Um, I don't got no help from the city. I don't got no, no food stamps. I don't got no 
voucher. I don't got no, I don't even got Medicaid. They cut me off of Medicaid. I'm paying for my own health insurance. Actually, this month I can't afford it. But it is what it is. 75% of my income goes to my rent. Um, I shopped around trying to get something that, that is decent, um, that is legal, but I was denied because the, there's one place I really, really wanted, and I told to my broker, I said, yo, I, I want that place. I'll make all the sacrifice I need. But the, but the landlord was like, you know, he's a felon. And then after that, you know, I guess he caught himself, and then he stuck with that. I don't make enough money. You know, um, and I really wanted that place. That place, I, I, I fell in love with it. However, I ended up here. It's a one-bedroom apartment, but it's an illegal apartment. It's uh, it's got one entrance, so it's a fire hydrant. Um, but believe it or not, I'm good. I'm happy to be here because I'm not stuck in that system that a lot of my brothers and sisters are stuck in. You know, I'm not. I, I, I'm I'm doing my. I mean. Sometimes I wonder how I'm gonna feed myself. I, I I wasn't able to pay my health insurance this month, but I keep my phone on. Um and I'm here. Um, but I remember that one apartment that I wanted that was a, a real nice apartment and and I couldn't get in because, because of my history. And I think that's the one of the main topics we're talking about here. That's why. I decided to testify today. I still would like to go to that apartment. In fact, my tenant is a, 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 a ASL school, a, 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 and I'm an ASL instructor. <laughs> I even try to use that as an angle to get in there. I said, "Listen, I, I could I could help with the sign language, but it wasn't. They didn't want me there. They didn't want my class of person in there. I refused to be stuck in the system." I refuse to get stuck in the ghettos. I'm in a one private apartment, I'm a, one, one, a private house. I sleep in the basement. I'm good for now. I'm struggling, but I'm good. I'm gonna continue to do what I can to be a productive member of society, to help my peers, to help my, my people. And that's all I gotta say, thank you for letting me share. Thank you. We're going to move on to Salik Karim. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is um, Salik Karim, and I'm an AFC coordinator at Georgia College Institute for, for Justice and Opportunity. However, I am also a formerly incarcerated person living in New York City who has been unfairly discriminated against in the housing application process by the use of criminal background checks. In spite of being released from prison in 2005 and maintaining full-time employment since May 2005 and receiving both a bachelor's and master's degree in social work, I continue to be discriminated against in the housing process. This discrimination not only affects me, but my family as well. The use of criminal background checks creates a false narrative about who I am and will have become in spite of my past history. It locks me into my past and creates barriers blocking movement into my future. I want to, be, I want to clearly state that housing is a human right, not a human privilege a human right. Therefore, everyone should be able to secure this human right. The use of criminal background, the use of criminal background, I'm sorry. The use of, one second, I'm sorry. The use of criminal background checks has negatively impacted not only me, but my fiance, now wife, by not allowing us to use my income as a resource for potential other housing opportunities, namely fair market, lottery apartments, housing subsidies, and rent stabilized apartment. In order to be, I want to find an apartment together, we had we got married 
and we both had to leave Brooklyn, New York, where we both lived for all of our lives. Because I kept being denied apartments because of my, my record. This effectively resulted in displacement from our family, friends, and community. It has also limited our selection, selection ability and opportunity to obtain more secure and stable housing. Though, though I have recently secured housing in Queens, New York, I could be evicted by the landlord on a landlord's whims because there are little, if any, protection available. And then I will be back in the same situation of being denied apartments after apartments because of my record. The simple act of moving apartments, which, which most New Yorkers, New York City residents do many times, isn't available to me and my family. If my landlord raises the rent, Time to and, I and I can't afford it, I may not be able to find another apartment before my lease expires. My 24 year old conviction leaves me and my family in perpetual housing instability. I am not the only person in this situation. One in three black men in the United States has a felony conviction. By continuing to allow housing providers to deny housing based on convictions, we can take we, we can we continue a significant portion of, of black men populated to lifetime housing insecurity. This is one of the reasons so many people need shelter and why the, the glaring race, racial disparities in the shelter. This is why the city council must pass intro 2047 to bar the use of criminal background checks due to a person's arrest in all conviction history. No one should have to live with this sense of insecurity like I have experienced when it comes to the human right of housing. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Creeman. And I just wanna, um thank you and acknowledge uh, your work on this. Um, this bill would not be uh, heard today and, and on its way um, to becoming law if it wasn't for your efforts. You, you, you uh, um, introduced me to this uh, uh, legislative idea and I wanna just thank you for, for doing that. Thank you, Mr. Kareem. Now we are going to have Allison Wilkie. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Wilkie and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the John Jay College Institute for Justice and Opportunity. And I want to thank Chairs Levin and Eugene for the opportunity to, pre to present testimony today about Intro 2047, about uh, prohibiting housing discrimination based on arrest or criminal record. The John Jay College Institute for Justice and Opportunity's mission is to create opportunities for people to live successfully in the community after involvement with the criminal legal system by addressing structural and racial economic inequalities. While much of our work focuses on pathways to education, uh, housing policy has become a focus for the Institute because so many of our college students that we serve who've been impacted by the criminal legal system have trouble finding and maintaining housing. Housing instability interferes with the student's ability to enroll in college and to succeed through graduation. And in this way, and in so many other ways, the inability to access housing is a barrier to economic opportunity. While my testimony is focused on discrimination based on conviction history, I also want to voice support for increased rental assistance and ending voucher discrimination. All the bills under discussion today are important pieces of the changes we need to break down the racial and economic barriers that prevent New Yorkers from accessing safe um, and, and affordable housing. I've submitted written testimony, but I want to focus my time here to speak about the issue of safety and to address any critics who say this bill would limit the ability of landlords to provide safe housing for tenants. First, it's really important to be clear that increasing access to housing increases safety. An inability to meet economic need is the key driver of violence. Housing is a core human need. It provides a foundation for people to get and maintain jobs, to care for their families, to contribute to their communities. It's the foundation for economic well-being, which decreases violence. And for people who've been in the criminal legal system, stable housing also decreases recidivism. So when we eliminate barriers to housing, we improve neighborhood safety for everyone. Second, it is a fallacy to believe that conviction history tells us who will be a good tenant or a good neighbor. 
Using background checks to determine whether a person is a good tenant simply entrenches our racist criminal legal system. The inequities of our criminal legal system are well documented and have brought, been brought fully to attention in the recent months uh, from the protests sparked by the killing of black men uh, and women by police. Yet we're still living with the reality that one in three African American adult men in the United States has a felony conviction. This reflects the reality that black people and other people of color are the targets of law enforcement and are treated more harshly and have worse outcomes once in the criminal legal system. I guarantee you that landlords have white tenants who have possessed or sold drugs when they were young or vandalized property or, or engage in other criminal acts, but those white tenants didn't live in highly policed neighborhoods. So they didn't end up in the criminal legal system and end up with a lifetime barrier of a conviction record. The I'm conviction expired. record says more about the circumstances of your birth than the content of your character. And what we think we know about risk turns out to be false. People with the most serious convictions typically have the lowest recidivism rates. For landlords who have a genuine concern about creating a safe community, this bill does nothing to change that. Nothing in this bill takes away the ability of landlords to do reference checks or to get information about a person's past tenancy, nor does it take away the ability to address an existing tenant who is causing problems, so long as the basis for that is the behavior, not an arrest or conviction. I'm happy to answer any other questions about the bill, about fair chance acts in other jurisdictions um, and uh, about this issue of safety. Thank you. Thank you to everyone on this panel. If any council members or if the chairs have any comments or questions at this time, otherwise we will move on to the next panel. Okay, so I'm now going to call on our next panel. Just wanna remind everyone that um, public testimony is limited to three minutes, and please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin your testimony before you begin to speak. The next panel will be Reverend Winnie Varghese, Stanley Richards, and Irobos. And we will begin with Reverend Winnie Varghese. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Winnie Varghese. I'm a priest at Trinity Church on Wall Street. Thank you to Councilmember Levin and Eugene for your leadership and persistence in serving the unhoused and vulnerable in this city. Trinity Church is the convener of faith communities for just re-entry, an interfaith coalition across the five boroughs working to end the cycle of homelessness and incarceration in New York City. This requires that Mayor de Blasio and the City Council take action to create a just re-entry system that provides for the safety of people released from jail stable housing for justice involved people and their families and coordinated support services that are held accountable to the well-being of each person. So thank you for the opportunity to testify on 2047. We are grateful for the leadership of council members Levine, Powers, Lander, and Carnegie and public advocate Williams in supporting this legislation that seeks to address rampant housing discrimination against New Yorkers with criminal justice records. A criminal justice record is not the measure of a person, nor should it be used to deny housing. In New York City, 15 to 20,000 New Yorkers are caught each year in the cycle of homelessness and incarceration. This cycle is perpetuated by the discrimination that our neighbors face during reentry from jail and prison, and in some cases, even before they are convicted of a crime. In New York, the probability that a person with a criminal record can even view an available apartment is 50%. Ban the box and the Fair Chance Act apply in education and employment, but not yet in housing. We must make it possible for a New Yorker who has served their time to rebuild their lives. At this time, NYCHA replicates the discrimination we see in the private market by preventing people with criminal records from returning home to their former households, while federal law prohibits individuals um, with some restriction already um, on who can come back into federally funded public housing. NYCHA uses its own broad discretion to deem residents as dangerous, leading to eviction and family separation through a policy called permanent exclusion. To be clear, NYCHA currently has the discretion to exclude people who have simply interacted with the criminal legal system, not yet convicted of a crime. Upon arrest and prior to conviction, eviction proceedings can begin. When we think about who cannot afford bail, we know who gets caught in this trap. According to the Vera Institute, between 2012 and 2013, 2,200 people formerly living at a NYCHA address were released from a city jail and sought housing in a shelter. As faith leaders, we are called to proclaim the beloved community, defined as a society that takes particular care of the vulnerable, the unhoused, those in prison. 
from the time of our ancient text, the fairness of systems of justice is important enough to be referenced as a sign of a community's faithfulness. Injustice equals a lack of love and fear of God. Faith Communities for Just Reentry calls upon Speaker Johnson and members of the City Council to pass the fair chance housing legislation proposed, putting an end to landlord discrimination against New Yorkers with a criminal record and their households. We ask that the City Council call for NYCHA to end discriminatory permanent exclusion policies. I want to thank the Council again for their leadership on this issue, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have spoken before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Varghese. Now we're going to have Stanley Richards. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Stanley Richards, and I'm the Executive Vice President at the Fortune Society. The Fortune Society is a 53-year-old organization that supports successful reentry from incarceration and promotes alternatives to incarceration, thus strengthening the fabric of our community. We do this by focusing on three possibilities. One, believing in the power of people to change. Two, building lives through service programs shaped by the experiences of our participants. And three, changing the minds through education and advocacy to promote the creation of a fair, humane, and truly rehabilitative correctional system. While many individuals in the criminal justice system know about the Fortune Society's role in providing services and performing advocacy for individuals who at some point in their lives were incarcerated, fewer individuals know that we also collect rent, refer calls to our superintendent, and have an annual haunted house party for kids and other families in the West Harlem community. In other words, we are also the landlord and service provider for two buildings in West Harlem. So we know the ins and outs of the world as well. As a result of our experience, we know that a resident or tenant's prior arrests or criminal convictions simply do not predict community surface safety or compliance to pay rent, be a good neighbor, or decrease the safety of the community at large. First, we are the service provider of the Fortune Academy. One of the uh, people testifying today was a former resident, which residents and staff also refer to as the castle because of its beautiful architecture. The castle is an emergency and transitional supportive housing program that provides a safe rehabilitative community for homeless people coming home from incarceration or who have conviction histories. Through regular case management, uh, we assist residents with a wide range of needs, including gaining and maintaining more stable permanent housing and employment, substance use treatment, recovery, financial planning and management, and family reunification. Second, we are the landlord for the nearby building Castle Gardens, a mixed use, supportive and affordable residential development and service center in an environmentally sustainable building. Castle Gardens provides long-term housing solutions for homeless, justice-involved individuals and their families, as well as low-income individuals and families from West Harlem and the greater New York area. Fortune decided to build both buildings in 2002 and then in 2010 because homelessness for people returning home from jail and prison is a massive barrier to reentry and stability. We saw and continue to see the massive impact homelessness has on the men and women who walk through our doors, pursuing, pursuing stability, including housing. We saw people come to Fortune seeking employment, but having no place to sleep or stay in the, stay, or staying in the shelter. We hear about the stories of people staying in the shelter, trying to maintain their sobriety, but trying to navigate the massive drug use that continues in shelters. There are still no laws on the books that offer protections and accountability that are needed to ensure that people with conviction histories can have a fair chance to seek and obtain affordable and low income housing based on the work that the individuals do to change their lives instead of the crime or conviction that he or she was convicted for. Despite this fact, Safety and community reaction are almost always two reasons that landlords use when asked why they chose to use criminal background checks when assessing an individual for housing. But when it comes to safety, not only does a lack of housing actually contribute to poor safety conditions overall, studies have found little connection between an individual's criminal history and whether he or she will be a good tenant. As Human Rights Watch has noted, the existing criteria invite arbitrary rejection of applica 
applicants without careful assessment of any real safety risks they, they might pose. As a result of the arbitrary nature of how landlords use criminal history and the fact that, that it does not have a connection to good tenancy, we urged implementation of intro 2047, which is similar to other laws known as the fair chance housing. At the Fortune Society's Castle Garden Building, we do an individual assessment, including interviews to assess a potential tenant's application. Instead of running the name through a computer database, our staff does a careful case-by-case -case analysis of each one of our potential tenants. In doing so, we rely on a number of variable factors that demonstrate rehabilitation and stability, and not on the structural racism that underlays our criminal justice system, which is also at the core of HUD's concern. The Fortune Society has also kept its promise to our partners, our tenants, and community at large of running and operating a safe, congregate, supportive, and low-income housing facility. In fact, a number of community members have expressed their appreciation that with the presence of the castle and castle gardens, their neighborhood has become safer and more beautiful. We have demonstrated how landlords can maintain safe buildings and communities and integrate diverse experiences without discriminating based on conviction histories and or credit history. As a formerly incarcerated man of color, I know firsthand how it feels when you are judged based on what you did or how much time you served. I also know the difference that emerged, that, that emerged when you see and engage people without judgment and you lead with hope and opportunity. New York City has an opportunity to end the housing discrimination based on conviction history, which disproportionately impacts black and brown individuals and families. End the practice now by passing intro 2047 and send landlords a message that discrimination in any form against one person is discrimination against all in society. Let's lead with hope and redemption and pass intro 2047. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Thank you, Mr. Richards. And now we are going to ha have Robos as our next witness. Time starts now. Hello, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank um, the people that made it possible for me to attend this hearing, which would be the Fortune Society, Joseph Sosoto and Amita Kilowan in their advocacy capacity. Uh, I want to highlight a community that's not, you know, to add to the crises, unfortunately, is the undocumented. You know, as, an un as a formerly incarcerated, undocumented uh, man of color, I can tell you that I make up, you know, over a million people in the city that's undocumented. Over 70% of us are employed or seeking employment, and we pay taxes, even though we're undocumented, which means we pay for the police, we pay for the fire, teachers, we pay for the city council, and we don't, we don't have a voice in this process because of our legal status or lack thereof. You know, we can't get vouchers, we can't be accessible for any federal programs. All of that, will, you know, all of that, we are, we're cut out from. And um, if it was not for GMHC and the Fortune Society, I would be stuck in the shelter system, I would say over 10 years now, or sleeping on somebody's couch. And, um, and it was very difficult, right? I mean, there were times where, you know, I, I, I didn't get a work authorization, so I had no money, no income. People couldn't hire me. I had to steal to eat. I got arrested for that. I was getting into problems in the shelter system, getting into fights, basically, working my way back to the incarceration system of which I've done 18 years. So the Fortune Society took a chance on me with no vouchers, no nothing, and it's safe housing. And I can echo what Stanley said, and even uh, Alison Wilkie, that this is a safety issue. Because if it was not for the safety of this place where we, we, we know there's no violence, no threats of violence, it's safe, it's clean, I have my own place, you know, I'm employed, so I pay rent. You know, if it wasn't for this place, I could be a danger to society. I could be out there in desperation, which, which drove me to criminal factors to begin with, lack of economic opportunity. 
discrimination, economic oppression is what it's all, what it's all dealing with. I could be out there putting myself at risk and being a danger to the community just to survive back to prison, back to ICE or whatever. And I'm not doing that because of the, the, the wholesome culture and the stability of the castle that Stan spoke about. And, you know, I've, I'm wondering if there's any kind of, um, if, if there's any kind of pathway for people who are undocumented. Because the only difference between an undocumented person that's working and one that's not working, it is just that, you know, just our status uh, can improve. But yet we pay taxes. And I'm we, inquired. Yes, I don't know if I hear you. Keep hope alive. So I want to thank Fortune Society. I want to thank Amita Kilwan, Joseph Soto. And uh, a last word for Chair Levin, you have subpoena power. You should not be begging and asking anybody for data. Just subpoena, just subpoena them. Make them give it to you, any department, you know? And um, yeah, it's uh, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I appreciate all that's been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Point well taken as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, E. Irobos. And now we're going to call on our next panel, which will be in this order, Velvet Ross, Michelle Carreras, Sophia Jans, and Winston Tokuhisa. And we will begin with Velvet Ross. Our starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Eugene. My maternal and paternal grandparents were a part of the great migration from the Jim Crow South. They stress education as the key to a better life adhere to those tenants. I adhere to those tenants. I attended a specialized high school in New York City, took advantage of the educational opportunities afforded of me. I went on to undergrad and then graduate school. I am a former Miss Black World New York, former board member of the Community Board 7 in the Bronx, and a former school teacher. I was told that if I abided by these rules and did all the right things, I would be fine. But I was wrong. I found that playing respectability politics did not did not allow me from becoming homeless. I became homeless after living in an unsafe apartment that was unlivable. That led to the deterioration of my health and led me to become disabled and unable to work. With these multiple structural factors, gender, race, and poverty, it forced me into the shelter. The saving grace was receiving a city FEPS voucher. I thought this would give me the opportunity to live a better environment, a new opportunity to start over and to live a better quality of life trying to find a safe and habitual apartment for a single person on $1,246 is a Herculean task. I don't have enough black girl magic for that. With that amount, I'm still living in the modern Jim Crow because data shows that African-Americans often face barriers while attempting to move from more favorable neighborhoods. It set me on a path to see the deep, dark, racial, gendered classes, institutional divides in housing, homelessness, and eviction. Living a new existence as a displaced black disabled woman, even with my education, navigating the bureaucratic system, maze of obtaining and keeping a voucher is still cumbersome. As now I'm dealing with trying to renew my shopping letter after my case was closed by home base while I was hospitalized. And because of that, now I'm on the verge of becoming homeless again. The dream of equity and equality that my grandparents had is still that, a dream. Let's do the work and make the reality pass. In please pass intro bill 146 so that fair market value is fair for the next generation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And now we'll have Michelle Carreras. Time starts now. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm here to testify today. Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I've spent the last two and a half years in a domestic violence shelter, myself and my nine-year-old son. Um, I'm currently a student studying to be a medical surgical tech um, while helping my son with his remote distant learning. My story is one of a billion in this city. Um, I feel like every day that I'm in this shelter, my safety, my son's safety is put at risk. 
Um, I was told domestic violence victims get, you know, you guys get a lot more leeway, you guys get a lot more help. And I find that it's harder for us. There's a stigma attached to it. Um, I speak to landlords, I speak to brokers, and I don't get a call back the minute that I mentioned that I have a voucher, the minute that I mentioned, I mentioned that I'm in a DV shelter. There's very little help for us in the system that is already broken. Um, our housing specialist, her, she's overworked. Um, she will give us the applications, but the applications do nothing for us, the management companies are telling us they don't have anything to match our voucher amount. Um, give them my information in regards to my voucher and, and in regards to how I make my money. That's where I stop hearing from anybody. It's already been, like I said, two and a half years and it, it's to the point where it's very discouraging and I don't understand how is it that why I have to go back into DHS family shelter system in order to get help when I am a domestic violence victim. I've had to have my son added to an order of protection while being in the shelter. So I, 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 I'm at my wits and my hands are tied and it's, it's, it, I'm, I'm stuck in the system and it's a, a, a revolving door, unfortunately, that we can never get out of. You're just, you're just running, and running in circles. Um, I vote to put in, you know, produce happy people and, and productive people in society. And it's impossible with everything going on in this climate to move forward. I thank you again for listening to us. I really, really hope you take into the consideration to the families that are struggling. My, as I said, I'm one family in this shelter and there's over 50 families in the shelter. Thank you, Michelle. Now I'll call on Sophia Jans. Time starts now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you for allowing me to testify in regards to my struggle with my family. But um, this rental discrimination started even when we were in the shelter because of the lack of information, the lack of the right information, because they would give us, in other words, a pie that was empty and, told, and we were told to eat from it. But yet when we were out searching for apartments every day, every day of the week, the weekend, all these hours, and just to get home on time, it was a struggle. My children are depressed. We've all gone through therapy. My youngest has um, mental disabilities as, long as, my, as well as my middle daughter. And we've been struggling with everything to find out where we can go and thank Lord for someone giving me information about Neighbors Together. Um, we've gotten more information about rental discrimination and it helped us because we were able to record an agent on, 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 in this recording and she made so many mistakes in regards to the apartment knowing that I was qualified for it and it was a two bedroom unit. And once she found out I had a voucher, it was, oh my God, you don't qualify. The amount is too high for your voucher. It will not accept. So with that, it made us go right back to square one, feeling like a victim, feeling like we're never going to get out of the hole. And we were victims of domestic violence. We were in the shelter. We were switched to another shelter, a regular family shelter. And with all the money that was spent to just house us there, it was incredible to see the, the math behind it and to understand that we're not even getting half of the amount that they were charging the city to keep us there for a month. And we're still struggling and we've gotten some positive feedback from it. And with the help and the organization that's been helping us since we've gotten to know them since last year, 
we're more knowledgeable. We have more feedback. We have more information. And I've been playing it forward, helping other people, especially my neighbors, especially people I bump into in the street or at these interviews for apartments. And we really need to put some fire behind this, this motion, this thorough um, 146 bill, intro, sorry, excuse me, the intro 146 bill, because once we can get at least an amount that can cover a one to two bedroom and look at our family size, we can actually start living like we're people because we were never supposed to lose the fact that we are people. We're part of this city. We're part of this government. We're part of this Time world. Time expired. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophia. And now I call on Winston to do so. Uh, sorry, now. Be, oh, sorry, if you could hold the time for a second. Just before the next uh, uh, person testifies, I just want to acknowledge that we were, have been joined by council members Traeger, Drum, uh, and Rosenthal. And uh, Council Member Rosenthal does have a question. Council Member Rosenthal, do you want to ask your question now? Thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, no, I'll wait till the end of the panel. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. My apologies. You can continue. I will call out again on Winston Tokuhisa. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Winston Tokuhisa. I'm an aspiring software engineer. I'm also 34 years old and I've been struggling with housing insecurity for almost half of my life. I first became homeless in 2006 after my father locked me out. Since then, I've been actively seeking the right path out of poverty. After researching a variety of different career options, I've come to the conclusion working in the information technology sector is the best for me. Unfortunately, even with in-demand skills, the housing instability caused by the lack of sufficient RIP subsidy has kept me from progressing. When I first received my SEPT voucher in the summer of 2018, I thought things were finally looking up. Unfortunately, by the time my voucher transitioned to city perhaps the following year, I realized it was nowhere near enough to cover the rent in NYC, even with the increase. Not wanting to consider myself beaten, I tried to get creative in my search for housing. Unfortunately, even when I was able to find opportunities, I can neither overcome DHS or HRA's demands nor source of income discrimination. The main challenges of finding housing with the City Fest voucher have been finding viable units for the loud price and more recently, racing the COVID-19 clock. It is virtually impossible to find even a small studio for the price of $1,265. And the lucky chance one does, the landlord either refuses to take the voucher or create a solution that they can. Prior to 2020, one could afford to be patient. Now, each day spent in a shelter means an increased chance of catching or transmitting COVID-19. These challenges have affected me and my ability to get housing by keeping in the shelter system for over two years. In the face of an unreasonable amount of pressure from DHS vendors, I refuse to move out to anything less than stable housing. Accordingly, this has significantly delayed my goal of becoming a software engineer. More recently, I have tested positive for COVID-19 exposure. Maybe if the city were paying my rent, instead of double that to the shelter, this would not have happened. The city must increase voucher amounts of fair market rate, FMR, for two reasons. First and foremost, it will enable individuals to move out of short-term shelters, saving their lives by reducing the risk of COVID-19 exposure and transmission. In addition, it will plug a leak in taxpayer spending by putting money and solving the actual problem instead of an imagined one. The city must also create and enforce robust source of income discrimination, SID laws, closing the loopholes landlords have abused to avoid housing to people, to avoid giving housing to people who need it most. Thank you for taking the time to hear my words. Thank you so much, Mr. Tokuhisa. And I know that Councilmember Rosenthal has a question for this panel. Councilmember Rosenthal. Great. Thank you so much. I'm actually um, walking between meetings, so sorry I'm not flipping the video, but I really just want to thank both Michelle and Sophia for illustrating the specific experience of women who are DV survivors seeking the support from the shelter system. Um, it's their stories and perhaps the next panel as well that are exactly uh, what we need to hear about 
in order to understand uh, what better the city could do. Um, so I, I really just, I just want to thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Seeing no other council members with hands raised for questions for this panel, we will move on to the next panel. In this order, witnesses will be Annie Carforo, Nicole McVinua, Shaniqua Bryan, and Lavon Witherspoon. And we will begin with Annie Carforo. Time starts now. Hi everyone, my name is Annie and I work at Neighbors Together with homeless New Yorkers who are looking for housing with rental assistance programs. And I'm grateful to testify on behalf of some incredibly important and frankly long overdue bills that will address um, rental assistance vouchers and source of income discrimination. Homelessness in New York City, we all know it's on the rise and more families are falling into the cycle for longer periods of time. My members, amazing people, are not homeless because they're lazy or they're incapable of independent living. They're homeless for a simple reason, because the solutions to address homelessness are failing. Contrary to the testimony of Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, move out options from shelter are extremely limited. And the primary tool, city FEPS, it falls so far below market rent that there's not one neighborhood in the city that has a median asking rent within $100 of the current voucher rate. When my members receive their vouchers, they are left entirely in the dark in terms of how to navigate the housing market. The Know Your Rights information Mr. Jordan referred to in his testimony is a small box telling voucher recipients source of income discrimination is illegal. Nothing more. Not what to do when a broker stops answering your calls or texts. Not what to do if you're told your income is too low to qualify for an apartment. The Source of Income Unit at the City Commission on Human Rights does incredible work to defend our members from source of income discrimination, but that's contingent upon our members having the information needed to report discrimination and having access to the unit. This administration has continuously underfunded the City Commission on Human Rights, shrinking the current Source of Income Unit. Despite the shortcomings of the City FEPS program, our members are breaking their backs to look for apartments searching six to eight hours a day, calling, emailing, texting brokers, talking to friends, joining Facebook groups, walking the streets looking for vacancies. For the units they can find within their price range, they are almost guaranteed to get discriminated against. And so many of our members have to accept and internalize the de degradation, humiliation, and frustration of discrimination because they are not taught their rights. For my members that do find housing with their vouchers, they're often forced to accept dangerous conditions with abusive landlords who will happily accept a signing bonus and then increase the rent just beyond their voucher rate at the time of a lease renewal. My members are doing nothing wrong. In fact, they're doing everything within their power to get back on their feet. They're trapped in an agency with an administration that based off of earlier testimony does not care to understand the failures of their programs. For council members who wanna better understand what homeless New Yorkers are up against, put the current system to the test. Go to a housing search website like Street Easy and look for a studio for 1265. Look at the quality and the locations of the apartments and assume that at least half of those available units will discriminate against you if you're planning on using a voucher. Now adjust your search. Increase the maximum rent for a studio to 1665, which is what City FEPS voucher would be worth under one, intro 146. Look at the quality and the location of those apartments. And imagine that we implement intro 1339, you understand your rights and how to identify and report source of income discrimination, and CCHR has the necessary resources to keep up with the demand. I'm expired. But by passing intro 146 and intro 1339, City Council has the power to give homeless New Yorkers a real chance to find housing and fight back against source of income disc discrimination. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Annie. We'll move on now to Nicole McVinua. Nicole. Oh. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole McVinnie and I'm the director of policy at Urban Pathways. Mm -hmm. Urban Pathways is a nonprofit homeless services and supportive housing provider. We assist single adults through a unique combination of street outreach, drop in services, safe havens, extended stay residences, and permanent supportive housing. Urban Pathways serves over 3,700 New Yorkers in need each year. And our ultimate goal is to help those we serve achieve and sustain their highest level of independence. To that end, housing rental subsidies are an essential tool for helping our clients achieve independent living. And we know that a competitive voucher has the potential to provide meaningful access to the private market for low income New Yorkers. However, rental vouchers must be competitive in order to be functional and the current city funded housing voucher city FEPS falls short as we've heard from many people today. 
The current maximum apartment rent for a city FEBS voucher holder makes it next to impossible to find housing in the city's private market, leading to frustration and to recipients competing for the same apartments in a very limited pool that matches the rates. This forces those exiting homelessness to move to neighborhoods that may be far from their supportive resources, including their friends or family, healthcare and mental health care and employment opportunities. The single adults urban pathway serves who qualify for a city FEPS voucher receive a maximum monthly rental allowance of only $1,265 for a one person household. And this amount only accounts for 72% of the fair market rent for an efficiency apartment, uh, which for FY21 would be $1,760 a month. Um, so yeah, we've heard the numbers, we know it's very difficult to find an apartment. Uh, and that is why we're testifying in full support of intro 146, which would maxim, match the maximum rental allowance of any fully city funded housing rental subsidy to the FMR. Now, matching the city's voucher rates to the FMR would make the city FEPS voucher uh, much more effective. It would also prevent um, folks from getting evicted when there are rent increases since the lease renewal, uh, at lease renewal because there would be a raise with the FMR. Um, this would make a world of difference for our clients who are in our drop-in center and our safe havens, especially those who don't qualify for other housing opportunities like supportive housing. Um, we would also like to suggest to the council that another way to improve the efficacy of the city FEBS voucher would be to expand the eligibility to current supportive housing tenants. Um, we have a number of tenants in our programs who have had great success and recovered and they're ready to move on to fully independent housing. Um, and so by making the city FEPS vouchers available uh, to our supportive housing tenants, we could then open up supportive housing slots for the folks coming out of shelter who really need those supportive services the most. Uh, so we'd like to recommend that to the council. Um, and we'd also like uh, to voice support for intro 1339 uh, to provide rental um, assist those on rental assistance with source of income discrimination information, because we know that that is a, a huge barrier also, as we've heard today. Uh, thanks very much. And we urge you to pass intro 146 and intro 1339. Thank you, Nicole. And now our next witness is going to be Shanika Brown. Time starts now. Yes, hello, good afternoon. My name is Shanika Brown. Um, I'm currently a recipient of the City Pass program in which I have a city fest voucher for 1580. I currently reside in one of um, DHS homeless uh, hotel shelters with my family. I have a 13 year old um, with special needs and I have a 15 year old and my spouse. It's a, it's a complete struggle every day. I'm calling brokers either once I tell them that, you know, I have a voucher I either get, um, I'm busy or I don't get a response or I get, you're not eligible. Um, I have been applying to the HPD Housing Connect. Either the only time you get a response from that is when you either don't meet the qualifications or your voucher doesn't, you know, cover the whole, the whole subsidy amount. Um, it's a really difficult task. I'm also employed with the City of North um, of Board of Education and, you know, it's been a really trying task with everything that's going on with COVID and then dealing with, you know, my my own personal experience with my children to do remote learning. And it's really a task to be able to function mentally, you know, it's very depressing. So that's why passing this, um, you know, there's nothing that you can get for 1580. The most that you can get is like a one bedroom. I even said I would take a one bedroom, but a lot of brokers are like, you can't do that with a family of four people. So it's very discouraging. So that's why I really vouch for the passing of this bill, intro 146 and intro 1339. It would really make a difference and it would end the problem of homelessness, I believe. Thank you so much. I hope that everyone is safe. Everyone, everyone that was affected by this COVID my deepest and sincerest condolences, and I just wish everyone the best. Everyone stay safe and blessed. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Shaniqua. And now our next witness is going to be Levon Witherspoon. Time starts now. 
Hello. Hi, LaVon, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is LaVon with a spoon. First, I would like to say I'm a member of Neighbors Together, and I would like to thank Miss Annie Cafaro as well as the council members for really putting this together because this situation really to need, needed to be heard. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm one of, I am a city FEP person right now, but I had the first city I had the first city voucher, which was linked in 2014. Um, I found the one bedroom that DHS approved for me and my son to move in. And then when I got there, about coming into the first year, I had a lot of um, violations in the apartment. Um, long story short, I complained about the issues. Um, me and my slum landlord were going back and forth to court. It was in a private house. And then he evicted me. Um, he evicted me in 2017. And for that year, I didn't want to bring my son back into the shelter system. Um, I tried to reach out to a lot of people so somebody could take notice of what's going on because the, the, the voucher wasn't working for the people. Um, for that 1268, that's what I was able to get was a slim, slum landlord's apartment. So if we fast forward to 2020, I'm back in the shelter another two years with a new voucher that was only a 50 something dollar difference that's still not working for the people, you know? and um. This intro 146, oh my gosh, it really needs to be passed. And once again, I'm just so happy that you guys really gave me this opportunity to kind of speak out because um, it was kind of quiet for a while coming from the higher up, you know, but I know we have to stick together. Um, the low income people, the, 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 the homeless families, all the working families, we are the ones that are in the shelter system. The shelter system that's very bad, and a couple of people spoke on it, which I feel like is a quite catch-22. How can you pay thousands of dollars to live in a, a, a homeless shelter that's bad? Um, it's, it's dangerous. You don't have the proper food. Nothing is, nothing, no one is helping you. You're paying all this money, but then you won't advance the vouchers. And what's more bad is that if my voucher is 1323 and I find a one-bedroom for 1500 we are not allowed to add the balance of the rest of the money to add up to the 1500 If that's not a catch-22, I don't know what it is. Because it's like, okay, you gave me the voucher. I don't have enough money, but I'm willing to pay the difference. We're not allowed to do that. Or we can lose our voucher and get yep. in trouble. You know? So um, I just want to say, again, thank you. Because um, when I spoke with Miss Annie, I just cried. Because it was like, finally, you know, we as a people, we really have to stick together. It's not a one-man thing. It's all of us. We have to stick together, but I'm grateful for you guys, you know. So um, I don't know if my time is up, but that's just what I wanted to say. I just wanted to say thank you again. And I'm just so happy that it's actually being noticed really, really now is really being noticed. This is very serious. It's, it's, it's a problem. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this panel. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Witherspoon. Chair Levin, do you have any remarks or questions for this panel? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one. Um, I just want to thank um, uh, Ms. Caforo and, and, and Neighbors Together. Um, when I met with them, oh, probably uh, almost two years ago now, um, you know, they confirmed um, on the ground what, what we had suspected and, and had been talking about, um, which is just the you know, how difficult in real terms it is. And so they, they pointed out how they're able to navigate um, for their clients. And a lot of it is just, it's like, you know, shoestring stuff. And, it's, and, 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 and it also involves working with the Commission on Human Rights. And so I just want to acknowledge um, that, you know, there, it is, it is so, so difficult. And um, so I just want to, um, you know, really acknowledge all of the clients and providers that are out there every day um, uh, trying to make this work despite these huge um, obstacles in their way. And, and Ms. Witherspoon, you're absolutely right that it's, you know, it, the catch-22 and the frustration of having, um, you know, an apartment that you could make up the difference for, but um, because of a policy decision that they decided on, um, several years ago, you know, they'd make it literally impossible to have anything out of reach of whatever the, 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 um, uh, the city fest amount is. And so um, there's, we can be doing so much better uh, 
by all by all the clients out there. So thank you so much to this panel. Now I'll call on our next panel. The witnesses for our next panel will be in the following order. Sharon White Harrigan, Kendra Clark, Sean Boyd, and Victor Herrera. We'll begin with Sharon White Harrigan. Start now. Thank you so much. And thank you, T11, for the work that you do and the city council members for having this hearing. My name is the Reverend Sharon White Harrigan, and I am the executive director of the Women's Community Justice Association, also known as WCJA, co-founder of the Justice for Women Task Force, and a member of the Faith Communities for Just Reentry. And we support the bills that are on the table. And as a person who is also a returning citizen, I too have been the target of housing discrimination because of my record. And on the other end of the spectrum, having ran a shelter contracted with DHS, the vouchers as we know it make it impossible for people to succeed. And it's appalling to be here having to testify to things that should be a, a, a natural human right and asking for a fair chance in housing. When will the city get the message that those closest to the problem have the solutions. Policies and regulations are constantly created for a population that they do not understand. How many people in DHS have been homeless or incarcerated? People need stability to further their course in life. And the current voucher system is designed to keep the black and the brown community oppressed because that is the population that's in the shelter system. And then you have people in DHS like Arlene Bogard, a program administrator in the director's meeting, not knowing people's history, calling people with justice histories garbage. And is this the entity we are to believe and trust in to help the people effectively and have their best interests at heart, to care about the community that they serve when there is zero accountability we need to change how we do things and who you have doing it the reality is that these systems are never going to work until you bring we us the people to the table so let's do the right thing here let's pass these bills because the vouchers as it is is just another knee on our necks and guess what we still can't breathe thank you Thank you so much, Reverend. And now we will have Kendra Clark to deliver testimony. Time starts now. Yes, hi, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Sorry, my video for some reason is, is failing to work today. Um, I am Vice President of Policy and Strategy with Exodus Transitional Community. We're a preventative reentry and advocacy organization with locations in East Harlem, as well as upstate New York. And we also have hotels that we're currently servicing um, for people who are released from incarceration during COVID in Queens and Manhattan. Um, I just wanna start today by really thanking Council Member Levin, everyone who spoke, uh, Devon Nash, I really appreciated your uh, testimony. You know, getting to hear from all the folks firsthand is, is really important for us. Uh, as a directly impacted organization, 90% of our staff uh, have criminal justice histories, as well as, you know, 100% of our uh, residents. Um, I wanted to fully support as an agency all three of the bills today, intro uh, 2047, 146, and 1339. Uh, just to speak briefly on the issue with the vouchers, um, you know, as a Mach J funded hotel, in April, when we opened up the hotels during COVID, you know, we were told that we were not, because we were not a DHS funded shelter, our folks would not be considered homeless, right? They wouldn't qualify for any of these housing vouchers. I just wanna personally let you know, it took me four months of working and, you know, really fighting the system and, and working with HRA and really pulling in CSH. And I really wanna give them a shout out on the phone because I think if we wouldn't have been able to pull them in, we would still probably be sitting here today not having access to the CAP system or access to the voucher system for our residents. Um, with that being said, when I got access to the CAP system, 
I called the HRA number for a week straight, left voicemails. I never heard a response. It was not until I had to take it up to a higher uh, you know, ranking official at HRA for them to be able to actually give me my password so I could actually move through the CAP system. So there's definitely a lack of communication and coordination. If I was calling the HRA hotline for a week, trying to get this as a vice president, I can only imagine how frustrating it is for our residents and our participants to continuously call a number and not have anyone answer or not get any response back. Um, in addition to that, I have folks who we are, who have had expired FEPS vouchers, and now we are reissued, you know, getting them reissued. Uh, one person that just came to me in the last 10, uh, two days, about 10 people have showed me expired uh, FEPS vouchers that they need to get renewed. One was from March of last year, so it's been about 18 months. So, you know, from our experience, what we're seeing, people are having these vouchers for 18 months, two years, and they're still not able to get housing. So any, um, you know, improvements that we can make upon the voucher systems, I think is really important. In addition to that, uh, I just want to let you all know, it took me five years after coming home from prison as a white woman to find housing. I had to stay in a relationship that I was not happy in because um, I was not able to qualify for all the housing vouchers. Um, and again, five years is, is just such a long waiting period for someone to try to get housing when you're coming home and, and working and doing what's right. Uh, in addition, I wanted to just respond a little bit to Council Member Holden. You know, he spoke a lot about uh, how we could demonstrate that we've been rehabilitated or he talked about consequences to tenants um, and, you know, for me personally, it kind of almost seems like we should just wear a sign across our neck that says I'm a formerly incarcerated six times felon. And that's what I should just have to wear around no matter how long I've been home because apparently that's kind of more important than, than giving people housing and housing is a human right. We should not be talking about consequences or demonstrating rehabilitation um, when this is a human right. Folks need to come home and get on their feet and they can't do so without housing. Um, in addition, I think that we should also, um, you know, really think through if you wanted to talk about demonstrating rehabilitation, who would demonstrate that? As a formerly incarcerated woman, I haven't even applied for a certificate of good conduct because I would have to demonstrate I'm rehabilitated to parole and parole had nothing to do with my rehabilitation. They did not help me when I came home. So just thinking through who do we have to demonstrate these things to? I think is a very important um, point in this. And I really want to stand firm that this should, you know, we want to plant prohibition on this and that we should not have any waiting periods. There should not be any display of rehabilitation. Um, housing is a human right. And, and, you know, we're here to fight for that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kendra. We will now move on to Sean Boyd as our next witness. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Sean Boyd. I was recently released this past December from prison after serving 30 years for a crime that I did not commit. When I was released, I had no idea of how difficult it would be to find housing here in New York. There is no system in place to prepare you for this difficult transition or challenge, and words cannot describe what one will face upon entering in a city shelter. Imagine preparing every day for your release from prison and your first day home being placed in an environment that lacks structure, caring, or basic hygienic necessities, where drug addiction and mental disabilities are allowed to run freely. Housing is a fundamental right of every human being. Housing is just as vital to our society as liberty and justice for all. Yet we have in a society that denies us this fundamental right. I get up and go to work every day. I'm taking classes online to further my education. I'm active in my community, working with the youth. I'm a law abiding citizen and I pay my taxes, but I still cannot find affordable housing. The laws that govern housing in New York whether we look at the process of background checks, NYCHA using B misdemeanors to deny applicants, this system is no different than the black codes that were instituted during the past reconstruction period of slavery to keep former slaves from making progress in society. 
there are many former prisoners like myself who have educated themselves and who really want to be given an opportunity to be an integral part of society. But by denying us a fair chance at housing, you stack the deck against us before we even exit the door. We need to address these problems that denies the fundamental right of fair housing. And I thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Boyd. Thank you. Yes. Now call on Victor Herrera as our next witness. Yes, no. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm basically, I'm going to basically go off of what I already wrote, okay, because honestly, it's, it can't be no clearer than what basically I've been going through. My name is Victor Herrera. I'm a native New Yorker and a directly impacted individual who spent three years in the Department of Homeless Services inadequate shelter system. I want to thank the panel, especially the chair, Stephen, Stephen Levin, for pushing many of the concerns on the City Council Committee on General Welfare. Much of the discrimination faced by the homeless and formerly incarcerated are threefold mental health discrimination, criminalization, and the use of homeless status, income-based discrimination to keep the economically challenged from equally benefiting from the programs that's enforced. As someone who is, who is also formerly incarcerated, the high, highly policed shelter environment manifests serious trauma for me as the oppressive environment feels no different in a correctional setting. While in the shelter system, including 30th Street Mount Shelter, I was criminalized and subjected to unlawful uses of practices under the guise of reporting of emotionally disturbed persons by the EHS police on account of my reform activities and have provided previous testimony on the subject of housing discrimination to this, to this committee. I am presently faced with a holdover eviction and am increasingly concerned about how I will find alternate housing as I have been overlooked many times over with no reasons or clear justification, even while applying for units within my own community board for which I am supposed to be able to benefit from community preference. I have always believed that change, changes do occur when you change the environment of those affected, whether from good to bad or bad to good. The test only can be demonstrated by the history of planning and implementation. Those changes cannot occur if we continue to deny those human beings economic equal, equality with programs that we can clearly see have not worked. One example is NYC Connect, implemented, implemented by the City of New York Housing Preservation De Development and Housing Development Corporation under the umbrella of the Department of Homeless Services that was intended to provide an online portal to find and apply for affordable housing. I have tried to use this resource, but discriminatory assessment and selection criteria have prevented me from qualifying, though I have submitted 50 to 100 online applications. I saw clear evidence of income-based discrimination when I applied for a unit priced at 509 monthly, which I could more than afford with a monthly voucher for $1,265 from City FEPS. But the unit required a yearly income of 24,600, which I did not meet. This requirement allowed the developer and the nonprofit to escape accountability and deny me eligibility. The practice is a barrier for many of the homeless and formerly incarcerated people to obtain affordable units, which only perpetuates, perpetuates homelessness on a higher level. I also want to bring to the council's attention further concerns related to housing discrimination and treatment of people experiencing homelessness, which are not address, uh, directly addressed by these bills, and ask that you consider amendments or further legislation to address these issues. I am presently being deliberately overlooked by how the city of New York is permitted to use and disseminate housing situations as those of, as, as those of the homeless to the developers, yes, who then use to pick and choose through disqualification practices poverty-stricken individuals from benefiting and to add insult to injury, the Department of Homeless Services, who are very familiar with my advocacy and reform has, uh, activities, has included federal, which has included federal lit litigation, has led me to question whether the lottery system is a, actually a control type process that disseminate, discriminates against the homeless and poor minority community, as well as with the disabilities, conviction records, and mental health concerns. The growth in homelessness is presently the problem of the city and allowing developers to skirt their responsibilities to allocate to house the homeless and risk the homeless individuals. All the legislation the council is considering today, the HS that mentioned above, needs to be passed immediately. We must remove the stigma, which many of us have been subjected to in violation of the Equal Housing Opportunity Act, and to put into practice the recognition that housing is a human right. City collectively prefer to wait to visit the shelter to put the pipeline. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Herrera. Seeing no council member questions for this panel, and um, I'm not sure that council member 11 has any questions as well, we will move on to our next panel. 
And I will call Eric Lee, Joseph Lunim, Nicole Branca, and Giselle Ruthier. We will begin with Eric Lee. Mine starts now. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Lee. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Thank you, Chair Levin and Chair Dr. Eugene and members of committee, uh, both committees for allowing me to testify today. Uh, in the sake of time, I'll summarize my written testimony. Uh, HSU strongly supports intro 146 to increase city funded housing uh, voucher rent levels to FMR. If vouchers do not better reflect the true cost of housing in New York, not just the cheapest, many more households will be evicted in the coming months and we will see a new wave of families entering shelter. Home-based providers are already seeing households that never would have needed their services before. Um, there are tenants who uh, previously had higher incomes who are living in higher rent apartments that are now unable to make rent. Um, since, their since their rents are too high, these tenants would lack future ability to pay, which is a requirement for one-shot deals. And if tenants cannot find a way to make their own rent, they're eventually gonna be evicted. Raising CDPEPs to fair market rent would also help families and individuals currently residing in shelter to move out more quickly. Uh, in response to First Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater's comments about how personal preferences can impact housing search length, by increasing rent amount, uh, rent amount levels, you will give more households more options. Um, we also urge the council to consider expanding eligibility for CDPEPs in the community to serve more individuals. Many individuals at risk of eviction uh, who never have been home homeless previously would not qualify for a city FEPS voucher and they would have to go to shelter in order to qualify. Um, HSU also supports intro 1020, um, which does uh, reporting around state FEPS. It's critical to understanding to what degree families are able to access this, to access this benefit as well as to maintain it in a timely manner. Um, there's currently no way for families to actively request assistance um, with applying for FEPS or if there's issues with their current application through the Access HRA app. Um, without this ability, we, we don't know whether or not they can maintain it. We recommend that the data for this uh, be parsed by zip code as well as by HRA catchment area, as well as increasing the frequency from quarterly to monthly reports so that you can better get real-time tracking for how this is going. Uh, prior to COVID, home-based providers reported that families were being inappropriately referred by HRA centers to them. Um, every time someone's referred, there's another chance it may fall between the cracks. To try to get at this, um, it would be helpful to also track the number of new cases that were submitted, to, uh, new FEPS cases submitted by HRA without needing home-based referrals, as well as the number of HRA referrals to home-based specifically for FEPS issues. Um, we also recommend broadening the reporting requirements for other city subsidized rental assistance to include in community versus uh, move outs from street or shelter so that we can that better sense. understand um, the ability of if people can access FEPS or whether or not they might then secondarily qualify for city FEPS if they get turned down for FEPS or can't access it. Um, and finally, uh, for Council Member or Chair Levin's pre-considered 6576, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to work with Council Member Levin and the committee to further identify bottlenecks in the city FEPS application process and uh, how we can help solve for them. Thank you for your uh, time and for allowing me to testify. So much, Eric. I'll call on Joseph Lunim as our next witness. I start now. Hi, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has put unprecedented pressure on housing resources in New York City, and we are bracing for a rise in homelessness this winter and into 2021. The City Council must take every step available to ensure that housing for all people and vulnerable populations are not disproportionately impacted by the current and growing housing crisis. Currently, there are two bills being considered by the Council that could have a major impact on New Yorkers' ability to secure permanent and dignified homes. Intro 146, which would expand city FEPS vouchers to a market rate, and Intro 204, which would prevent a landlord from inquiring about criminal history. We know that criminal conviction reduces the probability of a landlord's allowing prospective tenants to view an apartment rental by more than 50%. And formerly incarcerated people are nearly 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general public. If New York City is to make good on its progressive reputation, the city council must eliminate these discriminatory practices, with a first step being a clear prohibition. These issues are directly related to the controversy emerging in the Upper West Side, where temporary shelter has been <clears throat> um, a temporary shelter placed in a hotel 
has allowed to allow for physical distancing during COVID-19. Residents have come out in droves to defend homeless members of their community from horrific attacks, threats of violence, but unfortunately until recently, our mayor has not shown the same courage. Last week, we found out there were plans to clear out family shelters, fire current employees working there, and move residents in, and move the residents from the Lachern Hotel. This is just the latest injustice uh, that residents from the Harmonia shelter have faced. Many have languished in the shelter for years because they cannot find apartments with their city cups voucher. It is an all too common story for members of local New York. People often spend years fighting to get city fest vouchers, believing that once they have a shopping letter in hand, they will soon have a home of their own, only to realize that, get, that getting a voucher is simply the start of the fight. A research project led by local New York leaders <clears throat> and Take Root Justice um, engaged directly in impacted people, um, people who've experienced SID, to try to reveal how prevalent this problem is. It found that voucher holders are three times less likely to hear back from an apartment than those with income. When they do hear back, they are less likely to be invited for a viewing. In several cases, they were told bluntly, we do not accept vouchers. We found though that the largest barrier is the simple fact that the vouchers do not pay enough. When we began our research into the issue, it was our intention to only test listings that were within the range of the city FEPS voucher, or to mainly test listings that were in the range of the city FEPS voucher. But what we quickly realized was that there were simply not enough apartments on the market for us to get the kind of data we needed for our report. Currently, the average rent for a one bedroom apartment in every single one of the five boroughs is higher than what the city FEPS voucher will pay. That means every day, thousands of voucher holders are competing for a woefully small number of apartments that by definition are the cheapest and worst maintained housing in New York City. Rather than a ticket out of the shelter system, vouchers have become tickets to humiliation. Many people who are set to be transferred out of the harmonious shelter had vouchers for months or even years. They have watched voucher after voucher expire while the rents in New York City climb further and further out of reach. This is a public policy failure of the worst kind because it offers people false hope. It allows the city officials to claim they are doing all they can to help people secure permanent housing while more and more people endure the indignities of shelter because their vouchers are useless. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joe. I'll now call on Nicole Branca as our next witness. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Alyssa Kyle, testifying in place of Nicole Branca, and I am the director of, housing, of the Housing Link at New Destiny Housing Corporation, a 26-year-old nonprofit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness by connecting families to safe, permanent housing and services. New Destiny supports all of the legislation introduced today and thanks the council for their work on behalf of our most vulnerable New Yorkers. I would also like to thank the people with lived experiences who have shared their stories today. Most notably, I would like to address Intro 146 and the significant effect it would have on the lives of domestic violence survivors and their children. Domestic violence is the number one reason families become homeless in New York City. In fiscal year 2018, 12,541 people entered DHS's shelter system due to domestic violence and another 6,400 enter, entered HRA's separate domestic violence shelter system. Yet there are few housing resources made available for survivors and their families with the less competitive city and state subsidies typically being the only one. As a result, these families struggle to find apartments below the fair market rent. We know this firsthand. For the past six years, New Destiny, in partnership with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, has worked out of the city's family justice centers to provide housing, housing assistance. Our program, called Housing Link, connects victims of domestic violence with safe, permanent housing around New York City. 74% of our families with subsidies have city FEPs or FEPs. Our clients typically re remain in shelter for several months while our team searches for landlords that will accept this lower rental subsidy. Bringing maximum rent allowances for city FEPs up to fair market rent would provide a far greater access to housing for low-income New Yorkers like our Housing Link clients. According to the 2017 New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey, the vacancy rate in New York City is 3.63% and as low as 1.18% for the most affordable apartment in the city. Simply stated, city FEPS voucher holders and therefore many survivors of domestic violence are forced to compete in an incredibly tight market with a subsidy that is almost $400 a month lower than Section 8. New Destiny also supports the removal of time limits for participation in the city FEPS program. This too would put city FEPS holders on more equal footing with Section 8 holders and mitigates the risks of our families returning to shelter. In order for city FEPS to be the impactful city funded voucher program it was developed to be, 
we must ensure every family holding a voucher is able to utilize the assistance by aligning the voucher levels with the fair market rate and eliminating the current time limit, which places an unrealistic expectation on families. New Destiny strongly encourages the council to pass intro 146. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Now we will ask Giselle Ruthier to deliver testimony. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm the policy director at Coalition for the Homeless. I want to thank the council and the committees today for the opportunity to testify. We've submitted detailed written testimony in conjunction with the Legal Aid Society, but I will cover some main points now. On intro 146, the Coalition for the Homeless and the Legal Aid Society support raising city FEPS rent levels to the fair market rent. A critically important result of this change is that it will significantly expand the number of studios and one bedroom apartments available to homeless single adults by increasing the city FEPS rent levels for studio apartment by nearly 40% and the one bedroom city FEPS rent levels by 36%. Maximum rent levels for larger apartments will increase upwards of 25% as well. This will greatly expand the pool of available apartments for homeless individuals as well as families. In support of this goal, we have several important recommendations for amending the current bill language. First, the bill language must be amended to explicitly raise the city FEPS rent levels to the most recent FMRs. As the bill is written, it requires city vouchers only to be indexed to FMR, thereby leaving open the possibility that voucher increases will simply mirror FMR increases without matching their levels exactly. Second, we support adding requirements that apartments rented with city FEPS be subject to unit inspection standards similar or equal to the Section 8 housing quality standards. Using the higher federal standard for all city subsidies would promote housing quality, streamline the inspection process, reduce confusion among city and shelter staff, consumers, and landlords, reduce source of income discrimination, and maximize the availability of federal dollars for New York City tenants. <clears throat> Third, the bill language should expand the definition of rental assistance voucher to include all city initiated vouchers rather than vouchers that are fully city funded. In some cases, city FEPS and its predecessor link had some portion of funding allocated from the state and federal governments. That should not preclude city FEPS or any future programs from abiding by the requirement to meet the FMR standard. Lastly, the language should also specify that the city can and should use state and federal money to fund the increase of city initiated vouchers to FMR thereby providing a sounder financial footing for the continuation of the program. For too long, the state and federal governments have failed to contribute an appropriate level of funding for rent assistance programs. The coronavirus pandemic has clearly highlighted the indisputable fact that housing is healthcare. New York City was grappling with record homelessness prior to the pandemic. <clears throat> the department has noted several times in their testimony the decrease in the shelter census over the past few years, but I think it's important to delve into that more clearly. Over the course of this pandemic and in the months and years before, we have seen diverging trends in homelessness among families and single adults. Disturbingly, the number of single adults in shelters has reached all-time record highs many nights during 2020. In the latest comprehensive data from July, there were more than 19,500 single adults each night in Department of Homeless Services, shelters, safe havens, stabilization beds, and veterans beds, representing a 9% increase from the previous year and 122% increase from 2010 even at the same time that the number of families was. And I'll wrap up. The importance of raising city FEPS to FMR is that it will significantly raise the levels for studios and one bedrooms, a critical tool for helping to reduce homelessness among single adults and adult families. All homeless adults and families, regardless of whether they are homeless prior to the pandemic or as a result of the pandemic, urgently need an effective way to leave homelessness and return to stable housing as quickly as possible. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify today and, and to please see our written testimony for our full comments, including information on the other bills being heard today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Giselle. I'm now going to call up our next panel. In the following order, witnesses will be Basha Gerhards, Suzanne Adler, Victoria Phillips, Irene Linares, and Justin Lamort. And we're going to begin with Basha Gerhards. Good afternoon. My name is Basha Gerhards, Vice President of Policy and Planning. Oh, time started. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today to the chairs and for those who uh, share their experiences. Rebney strongly supports efforts to expand access to rental assistance programs. The data is clear that expanding access to vouchers is an effective tool to help integrate neighborhoods of opportunity and provide financial security for tenants in neighborhoods experiencing significant change. 
stabilizing households prior to experiencing housing instability, the trauma of an undeserved eviction process and entering the shelter system is simply the right thing to do. Housing instability is particularly acute in communities of color and for people experiencing mental health challenges because of the deep unjust impact of the justice system on those communities. Fair housing guidance also recognizes this disparate impact. For this reason, REBNY appreciates the efforts being made by the City Council to expand access to stable housing. The principal criteria for identifying if a tenant is qualified for housing should be their ability to pay without regard to the source of income. An owner has an equal obligation to tenants already in the building to provide a safe, healthy, and livable environment, a warrant of habitability. Indeed, achieving this balance is important and consistent with the Fair Housing Act, which only prohibits arbitrary and overly broad bans related to criminal history. Fair chance housing statutes, such as the Detroit Fair Chance Housing Ordinance, strikes a reasonable balance. The law states that owners may only investigate the applicant's criminal history for crimes relevant to the safety of other people or property. Coupled with implicit bias training and other education tools, if the council modifies intro 2047 to mirror that model, it will better support the obligation to tenant safety and will be consistent with existing fair housing guidance. Additionally, government should consider solutions that allow individuals who have been convicted of certain criminal history to have their records sealed and expunged so that property owners are not able to view any criminal history in relation to minor and nonviolent charges. Thank you for the consideration of these points. Thank you, Ms. Gerhards. I also want to remind everyone who is testifying, members of the public, that we are limiting testimony to three minutes. Please try to the best of your ability to limit your testimony to three minutes. If you are submitting written testimony, we have it in its entirety to be submitted for the record. And we have lots of individuals signed up to testify today. And we want to make sure we get to everyone. And so please, to the extent you can, please limit your testimony to three minutes. And also wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And so we'll continue on with this panel to Suzanne Adler. Time starts now. Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Suzanne Adler and I am a licensed real estate agent with Triple Mint and I'm also a ha housing advocate with Neighbors Together. And I'm speaking today in, in uh, support of Intro 146. Um, I'm glad to have my voice uh, included in this because I think that it's a voice that's really missing from this conversation and it's a voice that really is necessary in making any real and lasting change. Because I think that the city FEPS voucher can work, but I think that the way that it's set up right now is not working. And by raising the amount to market value is going to be a really, really good start. Um, I wanted just to tell a quick story because I think that that um, will be the most compelling uh, for everyone listening. And that is um, my first experience with dealing with a city FEPS voucher. And this was when I was just starting off in real estate a few years ago. I uh, had a listing with a landlord. It was a small studio right underneath the train in Woodhaven, Queens. And I listed it based on the size and based on, you know, where it was, the location, I listed it for $1,200. And I proceeded to receive 100 emails. I'm not even kidding, 100 emails about this apartment. And then I was trying to navigate all those emails, so I decided to have an open house. And I had 60 people come to the open house. There was a line around the block. All people with city FEBS vouchers. I had no idea what any of this was. And I couldn't believe how many people were looking for an apartment that couldn't find one. And in the end, I convinced the landlord to take the voucher. We went through what I would describe only as a nightmarish experience of dealing with the bureaucracy of the city FEPS voucher process, uh, the application process. And in the, in the end, it was heartbreaking, but um, this tenant did not get the apartment and the deal fell apart. And I mean, if this is happening over one apartment, I just, and there's thousands of people that are looking and there's thousands of, tens of thousands of people who are not in stable housing. Can you imagine going to look for an apartment and you're standing in line with, you know, 50 people to try to look at it and you, uh, you know, are wondering if you're gonna be chosen and you also don't sleep well at night because you're living in a, in a shelter. 
this, it just seems to me like this is a financial, like a good business decision to raise the voucher amounts. I think that landlords would be open to it if they're educated to it. You know, I know they have no choice, but like, I feel like we would have a lot more buy-in if we could really all work together. And the real estate, the real estate industry really needs to, to have a seat at the table with that. And I think that, you know, there's good, there's good agents out there like myself and many of my colleagues. I'm inspired. I think, I thank you very much. And, um, I hope you pass it. Thank you, Suzanne. Now I'll call on Victoria Phillips as our next witness. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear good and not choppy, right? No, we hear you very well. Okay, I want to make sure because y'all don't tell people when it's choppy. Good afternoon, Chair, Council Member, and all others. My name is Minister Dr. Victoria A. Phillips, no more as Ms. V, and I'm the Community Health and Justice Organizer at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center and founder of Visionary V. Over the past two decades in my career of medical and criminal justice, I have been fortunate to work in various settings as nursing staff, mental health professional, and even a director of reentry in hospitals, nursing homes, prisons, and jails, and within New York City shelter system. In my current position, I also at times work in the position of monitoring those in New York City corrections with a mental health diagnosis, Brad H. And part of that includes discharge planning. Are you aware that currently about 52% incarcerated in New York City are individuals with a mental health concern? They all need housing. I observe on a daily basis the importance of affordable and non-discriminatory housing to support the positive and stable foundation for returning citizens from incarceration with mental health concerns. Our nation has a nasty habit of creating unbearable conditions or situations and then returning back to its citizens while saying do better or pull yourself up out of bootstraps. Just look at how we disregard our veterans who also are cycled throughout our criminal legal system, hospital and shelter system. Let's be honest, our criminal justice system is built on white supremacy. That is clear by the large imprisonment of black and brown people. Um, I've worked as a case manager attempting to locate clients housing and heard the blatant discrimination. I've been the help, mental health professional working through the uh, anguish of helping people that are constantly being judged by convictions and stepping outside of my affiliations. I would like to say with the mother buried in the military cemetery, I take great offense to any council member who says a human being on domestic soil must prove themselves before being afforded a safe place of shelter. In a society where I have seen how easily one could be caught up in the criminal legal system, one third of black men have records and such known corruption within the largest gang in New York City, the NYPD. A conviction should not be the barrier to stop someone from stable foundation to do better. Shall I remind you of great men who also had records, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who wasn't respected by our nation until he wasn't alive, or even Nelson Mandela, two individuals I often use as examples in my re-entry groups. Anyone can become great when supported to do so. Lastly, I'd like to remind you all that during this pandemic, there has not been one day where a political figure or media has not mentioned one's mental health. Imagine the agony of maintaining your stability mentally while finding shelter. Imagine a parent returning home eager to be reunited with their children and needing shelter. The soldier who was not properly discharged forced to self-medicate and cycle throughout all our systems. They are our vulnerable populations. They are often disabled, elderly, and often forgotten and overlooked. It is time to remove the bigotry out of our city council and real estate communities and house the homeless. Remove renting a place of refuge as a privilege and return it back to being an enforced human right. Thank you for sponsoring this bill Intro 2047, Council Member 11, and all other co sponsors. Y'all stay blessed. Peace and blessings. Thank you so much, Ms. V, for your testimony. Now I'll call on Irene Linares as our next witness. Great. Hi. Time Good starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irene Linares, and I'm the Research and Policy Coordinator at Take Root Justice. Take Root provides legal participatory research and policy support to strengthen the work of grassroots and community-based groups in New York City to dismantle racial, economic, and social oppression. 
I'm here with Focal New York, with whom we partnered on a research project documenting the search for housing using housing vouchers. New York City's rental assistance programs were designed to help communities like Vocals access stable housing by guaranteeing a portion of their rent. But as others here will testify, source of income discrimination is pervasive throughout New York City. Subsidy holders often do not have the information on the rights available to them, and voucher amounts are too low to keep up with market rent. These issues and more are highlighted in Vocal and Take Root's new research report, Vouchers to Nowhere, How Source of Income Discrimination Happens and the Policies That Can Fix It. Our primary research method was matched pair testing, a method used to test for differential treatment and discrimination. We contacted 114 real estate agents with listings on Zillow and Trulia, presenting as someone having a housing subsidy, and then contacted the same agent again, presenting as having income from employment. Our findings show that people with housing subsidies heard back from agents nearly three times less often than those callers with income from employment. When subsidy holders did hear back from agents, they were more likely to be told that units were not available. Several also experienced blatant source of income discrimination, being told that, that subsidies were not accepted. Subsidy holders were less likely to be invited to view apartments than people with income from employment. Subsidy holders waited longer to hear back from agents than people with employment income. And the resource sheet provided by the Human Resources Administration to subsidy holders seeking housing in Brooklyn is outdated and ineffective as a resource. Our testing process also made clear the limitations of the CityFEPS voucher. Setting housing search parameters on websites like Zillow and Trulia using only the CityFEPS voucher amount yields relatively few results demonstrating that the current maximum payment amount of the voucher relegates recipients to compete for a small pool of lower quality housing. We urge the city council to take immediate action to protect renters from source of income discrimination. During the COVID-19 crisis, access to housing is a more urgent need than ever. We call for the city to pass intro 146, which calls for increasing the city FEPS voucher to market rate, Pass intro 1339 to ensure that subsidy holders know their rights and how to report source of income discrimination. Increase the financial penalties for source of income discrimination so that they serve as meaningful deterrents. Expand the triggering criteria for the city's certificate of no harassment program to include cases in which landlords discriminated against applicants or tenants based on source of income. Pass legislation to eliminate credit checks for subsidy holders. Those recommendations and more are detailed in our report. Now, it is imperative that the city council ensure that every New Yorker has safe housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Irene. Our next witness will be Justine Lamort. Justin Lamort. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Justin Lamort, and I'm a supervising attorney at Mobilization for Justice. MFJ envisions a society in which there is equal justice for all, and we've been doing so for the last 50 plus years. And we try to achieve this through providing the highest quality direct civil legal services system, providing community education, entering into partnerships, engaging in policy advocacy, and bringing impact litigation. I would also like to recognize the Brooklyn Law School's Housing Right Clinic, who drafted a report. We've had many friends and partners today speak, and I will try to be very brief and not go off what was on our written testimony and focus on a few amendments we would like to see. MFJ broadly supports a slate of legislation that is being brought today. It is practical and long overdue. We support the move to try to make a discrimination-free NYC, but believe there could be a few changes that would make it, the proposed bills even better. First, we would like to see uh, Council Member Powell's bill, which makes the important change from six to three households moved down to two, so that would be aligned with what happens at the state level. We agree with our partner that take root, Neighbors Together, and Vocal, that by making a source of income discrimination a triggering criterion to the Certificate of No Harassment Program by HPD would be a powerful motivator to prevent landlords from trying to profit through discrimination. And we would also want to make sure that the city adequately funds the source of income discrimination unit at New York City Council, Council Commissions for Human Rights, as enforcement is always the biggest challenge when it comes to source of income discrimination. Our office recently handled a case with the Fair Housing Justice Center and Housing Work that took months over a year. A real estate broker told our client who has HASA that he will not take that program. 
our client, Mr. C, said he felt defeated and that even though he had this government money, when they tell you that they won't work with you, thought he was lost. But only with a coalition of attorneys and testers through investigation, through litigation, were we able to be successful. So making sure there's adequately funding for enforcement is the only way to prevent source of income discrimination. We also want to applaud the efforts to address housing as healthcare and housing as important to racial justice by making sure that people who are trying to re-enter based on a history of conviction are no longer discriminated towards housing. Lastly, as to the bills addressing the vouchers, we applaud the use of creating better access and transparency towards those vouchers. But as many people said, the numbers simply do not add up. We agree with Coalition for the Homeless that instead of using the term index, we should make sure that we're using the FAR caps. So that way a future administration, which will be changing soon, will not make sure that we have an artificially low rent level. We would also would like to see an expansion of restorative justice that the Human Rights Commission has been doing by putting set aside for Time's people expired. with vouchers and see that program expanded to other affordable housing programs such as 421A or other lotteries. Thank you for your time. And we hope that these bills are passed so that we have a discrimination-free NYC and we see vouchers that people can actually use. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. We will now call our next panel, which will be in this order, Jacob Malofsky, Alexandra, Alexandra Dougherty, Reverend Wendy Calderon-Payne, Alfonso Riley, and Katie Schaefer. And we will begin with Jacob Malofsky. Time starts now. Thank you, everyone. My name is Jacob Malofsky, and I'm a tenants' rights attorney. Today, I want to speak about the necessity to pass Intro 2047, which would prohibit landlords from discriminating based on conviction history. As a tenants' attorney, I have learned that the general culture of landlords in housing courts is their belief that justice-involved individuals don't deserve housing in their building. This belief is generally not qualified, and explanations are not given why individuals with criminal records should automatically be denied housing. This view is currently protected by the law, which allows landlords to conduct background checks and deny housing to individuals with conviction histories, as well as their families. This culture and belief that individuals with conviction histories are not entitled to housing is dangerous to both the individuals who are re-entering and society as a whole. Many of my clients are or have the potential to become very productive members of society, but there are still so many obstacles to overcome, such as finding stable housing. My clients have worked very hard to rebuild their lives, find employment, and or go back to school. It is not uncommon for our landlords to overlook these accomplishments and only focus on the mistake they made in the past, often which are decades old. While many of my clients are protected from discrimination from their past in employment and education, they do not have the same protections in housing. We leave the decision whether someone is rehabilitated and therefore entitled to one of the most fundamental necessities up to a landlord. Housing is integral to maintain employment and being successful in school and to prevent recidivism. I have often found myself uh, confused that if my client has completed their debt to society, that we, do, that we deny them housing. Ideally, many of my clients who have family in NYCHA or other federally funded housing would go live with their family for and to provide support. However, under current law and policies, this option is generally not available. This leaves the only viable option to find a stable home and to continue to rebuild their lives is a private apartment. However, because of the current law, many landlords make this path impossible, leaving a person and their family to live in the street or shelter. This is a particular concern during COVID-19 where many families are expected to lose their homes due to financial hardships. The additional burden of trying to find a fine apartment with a conviction history during these trying times will only exacerbate the looming eviction homeless crisis. I don't think I would have been able to finish college, graduate law school, and pass the bar if I didn't have stable housing after I re-entered. This is why it's necessary to pass intro 2047 today and ensure that everyone is given a fair chance to rebuild their lives with stable housing. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Malofsky. We'll now call on Alexandria, Alexandra Doherty. Doherty. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good afternoon. My name is Alex Doherty. I'm a senior staff attorney and policy counsel of the civil justice practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Uh, I'd like to thank the committees and Chairs Eugene and Levin for inviting us to testify today. And I'd like to take this opportunity to speak in support of removing barriers to permanent affordable housing for New York City tenants. Brooklyn Defender Services clients are already embroiled in multiple legal systems, and therefore they routinely face barriers to stable and affordable housing. 
it's easy to understand why our clients, like many of the folks who've offered powerful testimony already today, are frustrated by the existing programs and guidelines. Their experiences demonstrate a clear need for more concrete options for every New Yorker facing housing instability. EDS supports all of today's bills. Our colleagues in the Fair Chance for Housing campaign have made clear how discriminatory background checks perpetuate cycles of homelessness, as well as the systemic racism of the criminal legal system. An arrest or conviction should not constitute a permanent barrier to stable housing. Yet EDS clients leaving Rikers are likely to enter the shelter system because they are routinely denied permanent housing. Prohibiting discrimination on the basis of an arrest or conviction record is an important step towards guaranteeing equal access to stable housing. We also support intro 146. Rental assistance vouchers are a vital resource for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness or at risk of eviction. But rent caps and source of income discrimination strictly limit the pool of housing available to voucher holders. This housing is already the most competitive in the city. The need for all of these bills is made even greater by the impending eviction crisis brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Rents have been rising in the neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic, and those neighborhoods also see the highest rates of eviction filings in the city. EDS clients searching for stable housing have been universally unsuccessful since March. Most of these clients are voucher holders, and we have found that the voucher eligible housing stock has dramatically decreased since March. EDS applauds the council's commitment to removing barriers to housing for all New Yorkers, but with that commitment in mind, we urge you to consider public housing residents and applicants going forward. Today's bills will provide support for New Yorkers hoping to gain access to private housing, but they will not apply to state or federally funded housing, including NYCHA which is home to as many as a million people. NYCHA's own regulations go significantly further than federal law requires in barring potential tenants and in evicting tenants who have any contact with the criminal legal system. BDS represents clients who are denied by NYCHA after years on the waiting list or who face eviction from their longtime homes because of NYCHA's restrictive and punitive policies. Amidst the city's affordable housing crisis and rampant gentrification, these clients have nowhere else to go. We ask that the council consider 2047 as a necessary and important starting point in our goal to ensure truly equal access to stable housing for everyone. Thank Time you. expired. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. We'll now call on Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne as our next witness. Time starts now. Hi guys. Um, uh, I am Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. I'm the Executive Director of Bronx Connect and Manhattan Connect. Since 1999, we have successfully supported justice-involved young people and families as they navigate their way out of destructive lifestyles and into fulfilling, productive lives. We have found few components are central in helping a young person make the behavioral change they need to live an adult-free... Uh, adult. Oh, I lost my... Uh, sorry to live an adult life free of justice involvement. Um, we find that at Bronx Connect, seeing an exciting future for a young person starts with seeing who people who look like you and sound like you. Bronx Connect youth are surrounded by staff and mentors who have walked in their shoes and ended up on a healthy path. Our staff are highly, have highly similar stories of struggles and yet they are living, breathing proof that things can change. And that with the right support, changes, uh, support systems change um, change, people can overcome their circumstances. Our model proves that a difficult circumstance like justice involvement doesn't have to be a life sentence. In 2019, we were blessed to purchase two R7 zone residential buildings. Um, this experience has given us an upfront experience with City FEPS as we inherited a family with a City FEPS voucher. As we have had to move this single mom out of that old basement moist apartment, we spent over six months trying to find anyone, and I mean anyone, who would take this working mom with four children on a $210 voucher. No one was willing to help me or this woman. Even I offered to pay the to match the city FEPS four-month benefit. No one wanted this woman for three reasons. One, outright city FEPS had a terrible reputation of red tape and not paying all the time. Two, they could easily get $2,010. They could get more than that for a two bedroom apartment in the Bronx. And finally, what one developer who I know to be an honest person said, Wendy, in four years, 
this woman's going to have four teenagers in an apartment with two bedrooms and it's going to be a nightmare. Um, those six months were unnerving. There were multiple times in city steps stopped paying. I could never find a case manager. And then I realized that city FEPS families don't have case managers, only unless they're about to get evicted, then they get a home-based case manager. I was actually told that I had to evict this lady in order to get her permission to move. Though I knew this wasn't correct, I still paid a lawyer to start the process. Although she and I knew we weren't gonna do this. In the end, I convinced my board to buy another building so that I could move her into the, the, the top floor apartment there. Uh, but even then, I was being told I had to quote a victor. Uh, finally, I was able to advocate to somebody in HRA and uh, doors opened up. Um, I'll be about, I'm gonna finish. I'm gonna broadly support moving this legislation forward today. I just like to make a point. There is money in the budget because so many of these city FEPS vouchers are not being used. They're being given out like candy, but everybody knows no one will find a, a landlord who will take them. In addition to that, what really shocked me is when I read in an article that what the city was paying in the homeless shelter for this family of four was significantly less than what I paid on the mortgage for a four family house. And I thought this is the biggest waste of money ever. We could empower nonprofits to take houses and renovate them and put get homeless families in there and get regular people in there. We could change the market if we thought about where our money was going. And that's why I'd like to support these bills, but I'd also like us to have an honest conversation about why we're spending so much money on homeless shelters that do not help people get out of poverty and homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. I'll now call on Alfonso Riley as our next panelist. Time starts now. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the New York City Council and others. My name is Alfonso Riley, and I'm employed by the Legal Aid Society as a paralegal case handler. I want to thank Council Members Levin and Eugene for the opportunity to present today testimony in support of intro 2047, prohibiting housing discrimination based on arrest or criminal record. I can speak to the need for this legislation because I have been denied housing because of a criminal record. In December, 2018, I was granted executive clemency by Governor Cuomo after serving 30 years, 10 months and 24 days in prison for a crime that I committed when I was 18 years old. While in prison, I earned a bachelor's degree and many certificates, including a paralegal certificate. I was released from prison the following month in January 2019. After approximately 20 minutes after I was released from prison, I was offered and accepted a freelance paralegal job. I continued to work steadily as a freelance paralegal for three months until I secured employment by the Legal Aid Society. I mentioned that to say that I have been gainfully employed since I was released. Yet, despite my gainful employment as a paralegal, I have been denied housing because I was incarcerated. I employed for, I applied, excuse me, for at least three apartments where the brokers or landlords said there would be criminal background check, which I had to pay for. Prior to the background checks, I was told there shouldn't be a problem with me getting the apartments. I was denied each time, however, based on what I could, on, what could only be in my criminal record. As mass incarceration and over-policing have disproportionately affected minority communities, housing discrimination based on a criminal record by extension will continue to adversely affect the same communities. To deny New York City residents housing of their choice that they are able to afford not only negatively affects a person with a criminal record, but also puts their children at a disadvantage as well. Housing discrimination continues to affect the schools children can attend, the air they breathe, the playgrounds they have access to, et cetera. This type of discrimination can affect generations starting from a single household. Housing based on one's choice and abilities should be a human right. The events that led to my conviction occurred over 32 years ago, but the collateral consequences of those events last to this day despite my transformation which was demonstrated by the fact that I was granted the extraordinary relief of executive clemency. I'm not the person that made a bad decision that many years ago as a teenager. I'm a law-abiding, tax-paying, and voting resident of New York City, 
and I want to be judged on the decisions I am making now, not the ones I made as a youth. I am one example among many, which is the reason intro 2047 should be passed Time's by the honorable expired. body. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alfonso, for your testimony. I'll now call up the next panel. In this order, witnesses will be Robert Desir, Antonio Garcia, Wendy O'Shields, and for Chenier Den Denton, we'll have Amy Bloomsack deliver her testimony. We'll begin with Robert Desir. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Desir, staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society Civil Law Reform Unit. This testimony is on behalf of the Legal Aid Society and the Coalition for the Homeless. I thank Chairs Levin and Eugene, members of the Committee on General Welfare and on Civil and Human Rights, and members of the City Council for holding this hearing and for taking the lead in these important matters. You have our written testimony that's submitted in tandem with the Coalition for the Homeless. My testimony will focus on the source of income discrimination expansion, intro 2047, intro 1339, and intro 146. The Legal Aid Society support, supports the council's proposal to expand prohibitions on source of income discrimination to buildings with three or more units. Since the source of income law has been passed, it's been an important tool in lifting New Yorkers out of homelessness, allowing them to leave substandard conditions and overcome the prejudice that prevents them from exercising choice to live in an apartment they can afford without being stigmatized because they use a voucher or a subsidy to pay the rent. We suggest that the protections be expanded to include the smaller non-owner occupied units, as is the case with the state law. This housing stock comprises a growing portion of the rental stock as speculators move past the multifamily buildings and look towards opportunities within this market. The council should also consider that source of income discrimination takes many forms and owners knowing the law use credit checks where irrelevant and impose minimum income requirements or rent to income ratios that effectively put an apartment out of reach for those with subsidies, creating a disparate impact. We support intro 2047. The disproportionate impact of over-policing and incarceration on communities of color is one driver of homelessness among black and Latinx New Yorkers. We view stable housing as the first vital step to a successful re-entry to society and towards keeping people from becoming further justice involved. Moreover, it is well recognized that arrest records are hardly evidence of misconduct and that landlords bar against prospective renters who have not been convicted of crimes is unacceptable. This bill, will, this bill would advance racial justice by reducing barriers to permanent housing for a large subset of people currently languishing in shelters and on the streets. We support this council in raising apartment seekers awareness of their rights and protections and support intro 1339. Although source of income protections have been in place for over a decade, the various forms of illegal rejections remain rampant and many remain aware of their rights, unaware of their rights. We know that the apartment search is highly time sensitive and very competitive, particularly at the rent levels available to those with vouchers and subsidies. Tenants who are aware of their rights are certain to fare better. With respect to intro, with respect to intro 146, we defer to the coalition, but we'll add that raising FMR to allow the vouchers to meet asking rents is a vital component of moving homeless New Yorkers into permanent housing, increasing choices available to renters, and attacking patterns of housing discrimination. I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Desir. I'll now call on Antonio Garcia as our next panelist. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on Catholic Charities Eviction Prevention Services and how proposed changes to the city's rental assistance programs can help us serve those who are at risk of homelessness due to loss of employment, unexpected expenses, or high rent burden. My name is Antonio Garcia, and I'm the Director of Preserving Housing, a homelessness prevention program of Catholic Charities Community Services. Through our preserving housing programs, Catholic Charities operates four home-based offices in the Bronx and one office in Harlem. 
all funded by the city and the state of New York. Using housing subsidies such as city FEPs and SEPs, we assist families and individuals who left the shelter system by providing aftercare services that include relocation or relocation to other apartments. Were it not for this subsidy supplementing the inadequate shelter allowance provided by the family assistance and safety net programs, public assistance recipients could not afford to pay the current rent levels in New York City. Nevertheless, current fair market values have outpaced this subsidy's maximum rental allowances, leading applicants and housing advocates to have little success finding suitable apartments within these limits. Landlords continue to deny apartments to tenants because this subsidy's rent levels are too low, and others enter into the so-called side deals that are so detrimental to the housing stability of the voucher holders. Finding suitable and affordable apartments for families and individuals coming out of the shelter system is an integral part of the homelessness prevention work that Catholic Charities does. We know how difficult it is to find apartments that are affordable for the working poor of New York City, especially for those receiving public assistance, and how increasingly important these subsidies will be as families recover from lasting economic and medical consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. That is why we support intro 146, which will, will allow the maximum rent of New York City's housing subsidies to increase annually at the same rate that, as HUD's fair market rents, and also remove limits on how long otherwise eligible households could receive rental assistance. By providing the means for families to access and maintain safe, stable, and affordable housing, Intro 146 will help usher in a period of sustained and equitable recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. We'll now call on Wendy O'Shields as our next panelist. Time starts now. My name is Wendy O'Shields and I am the homeless rights and housing advocate at New York City in New York City. I am the co-founder of the Urban Justice Safety Net Activist, and I support amending intro bill 146-2018. Let the record show, as per September 15, 2020, world -a meter statistics counts the United States coronavirus cases at 6 million. Total deaths, 199,000, and recovered are 4 million. The U.S. Center for Disease Control death count is comparable. Currently in our country, currently our country has 50 million unemployed and counting post COVID-19. We are in a compound emergency with infectious disease as the driver for our unprecedented economic disaster. 